Three years after the virus outbreak, humans have rapidly transformed into zombies with an insatiable thirst for blood. So far, no cure has been found. At this moment, the zombies are relentlessly pursuing two soldiers who have been ordered to proceed to the CDC, Center for Disease Control, to carry out a mission. Their commanding officer, Mark, has just closed the iron gate as the zombies swarm towards it. The zombies' eyes are white as they continuously pound on the gate. Just then, Mark receives another command from the command center. Operator Citizen Z tells him, We need you to escort the researcher, DR, Merch, to California with the vaccine. Your helicopter for extraction is already en route. This mission is of the highest priority. Please ensure its completion. Mark glances at the map and realizes that California is thousands of miles away. But as a soldier, he will not back down. Knowing that the gate won't hold for long, Mark instructs his subordinates to hold off the zombies while he goes to find DR Merch inside the research facility. If he can't hold off the zombies, he'll retreat to the institute. And he'll have to find the DR Merch the commander was talking about first. On the second floor, there are only two scattered zombies posing no significant threat. After a lot of searching, Mark finally found Dr. Merch, but she was still doing experiments at this critical moment. Three death row inmates are being restrained on operating tables. Mark urges her to evacuate with them, but Dr. Merch refuses. As this is her last chance to test the vaccine, the three inmates shout that they don't want to be guinea pigs. Dr. Merch firmly tells them that their sacrifice, if the vaccines work, will save millions of lives. One of the inmates, Murphy, argues against her. Yeah, well, why don't you take it then, huh? Seeing that DR Merch won't leave easily, Mark waits for her to complete the experiment as quickly as possible. Suddenly, DR Merch recites the humanitarian clause, stating that they are volunteering to contribute to all of humanity. The first volunteer is quickly injected with the green zombie virus. Within 30 seconds, he begins convulsing and then shows no signs of life. Blood gushing out, reacting swiftly, Mark shoots him to end his suffering and urges DR Merch to hurry. The other two volunteers witness this horrifying scene and scream for help, but it's futile. Next, the bald volunteer, unsurprisingly, also turns into a zombie. Finally, it's Murphy's turn, who screams and resists, but his assistant pays no attention and starts the injection. DR Merch nervously watches. This is their last chance. Suddenly there was a knock on the door. Mark saw that it was one of his men and opened the door, but the soldiers had already turned into zombies and jumped at one of the staff. Mark had just finished off the soldier, when several more zombies rushed in behind him. He shot the zombies again and killed them. At this time, the helicopter to pick up Dr. Merch also came to the sky. Mark rushed to pull on the frightened Dr. Merch to leave. However, Murphy suddenly sits up, begging them not to leave him behind. But at this moment, Mark can only ensure DR Merch's safety. Suddenly, the staff member who was attacked earlier also turns into a zombie and viciously bites Murphy. Immediately after, seven more zombies charge in. The scene can only be described as gruesome. Meanwhile, Mark and DR Merch have reached the stairwell to the rooftop. DR Merch mentions that the man from earlier didn't mutate. He might be their last hope in researching the vaccine. He tells DR Merch that if he doesn't return within two minutes, she shouldn't wait any longer. At this moment, the entire research facility echoes with Murphy's agonizing screams. In the end, Mark manages to save Murphy, but they miss the helicopter. Surprisingly, Murphy hasn't mutated. They arrive at a nearby survivor camp called Blue Sky Camp, and it seems like they have been living relatively well in the apocalypse. Once inside the meeting room, Mark speaks without hesitation, I need you to provide us with supplies and transport us to the next stronghold. Our people will meet us there and take us to California. The camp leaders, who were formerly part of the National Guard, hesitate to follow his command since the government no longer exists. Mark could see what they were thinking and could only tell the truth. He explains that he must take this person to the California laboratory as he carries the key to researching the zombie virus vaccine. The man was a bit surprised to hear that and then said I'm Garnett. Roberta and I will take you to the next stronghold and you'll be on your own the rest of the way. Mark said he was grateful. Garnett's subordinate, standing beside him, actually wants to object, believing that in the apocalypse, one shouldn't trust anyone, but Mark has the national interest at heart. Garnett quickly prepares some supplies for them, and Roberta takes the wheel to leave Blue Sky Camp. They only want to arrive at their destination and return promptly. However, just an hour after their departure, the man and his group start patrolling outside. 
when they reach the water's edge, they freeze upon seeing the entire lake covered in hundreds of floating corpses. The two men were breathing heavily and couldn't understand what was happening. As they approach the nearest corpse, something even more terrifying occurs. The zombies in the entire lake suddenly become agitated and charge towards them. Blue Sky Camp is likely in grave danger. Three hours later, Roberta, who had left, was still unable to contact the man and had received no response from the camp. She has a bad feeling in her heart. Garnett also becomes worried and wants to return to see what has happened, but Mark's mind is solely focused on completing the mission. Angrily, Garnett tells him that he won't care about his damn mission if something happens to his people. Mark aims his gun at them once again, resorting to moral coercion, and tells them that their immediate priority is to ensure Murphy's safe arrival in California. Roberta, somewhat perplexed, questions if Murphy is truly that important. Mark doesn't waste time explaining and forcefully pulls Murphy out of the car. Then, with a serious tone, he says, let them see why you're so important and why so many good people sacrificed for you. Murphy feels extremely displeased but has no choice but to comply with Mark's violence. He lifts his shirt, revealing scabbed wounds all over his body. Mark explicitly informs them that these are bite marks from eight zombies. They are shocked. As surviving after being bitten by zombies is considered impossible, Mark explains that he injected himself with an experimental vaccine just before being bitten. If he reaches California, his blood can be used to create more antibodies, potentially saving all the remaining survivors. At that moment, Roberta's radio crackles to life. It's a man named Doc contacting her. They had gone out to search for supplies and returned to find the camp in its current state. With gunshots ringing out, Garnett's expression darkens as he listens. The radio signal suddenly cuts off. Hearing this, Roberta can no longer ignore Mark's objections. She immediately turns the car around and heads back the way they came. Meanwhile, Doc and his group quickly run towards the camp. They want to see if there are any survivors. As they approach the road, they spot a large bus. They breathe a sigh of relief, assuming the children have managed to escape. But at that moment, they notice that someone in the back seat has turned into a zombie. However, the car was now moving in a shaky manner and there was obviously a commotion inside. And finally the car crashed into a big tree next to it. But as soon as the car door opened, several zombies charged out, causing them to turn around in fear. The children had also been killed. These zombies in Z Nation were not comparable to those in The Walking Dead. Not only were they fast and agile, but their mutations were also far more advanced. Doc, they're running like hell. One step slower and they're dead. They desperately climbed up the hill, only to be confronted by four or five zombies standing in the middle of the road. While they were thinking about what to do, they don't dawdle because the zombies are coming up behind them. They quickly climbed into the back of the truck. Inside the vehicle, Garnett wanted to inquire about any survivors at the camp, but Doc shook his head, indicating that not even the children had survived. Upon hearing this devastating news, a somber atmosphere filled the car. Even Roberta, who was driving, became absent-minded. Mark, however, didn't pay attention to their emotions. He took command, directing Roberta to make a left turn not far ahead, where a military stronghold was located. Delivering Murphy to California was their top priority, and so the expedition was formed. Half an hour later, they arrived at their destination. The place was in ruins, shrouded in smoke, and even the gates had been breached. It didn't look like anyone was inside. Mark had a sinking feeling as he held his gun and went to investigate. Underneath the car Mark saw the military men but they had turned into zombies. He had no choice but to send them on their final journey. It was evident that this place had also fallen. The others cautiously exited the vehicle, keeping a watchful eye on their surroundings. Except for Murphy, who's pissing himself with no sense of propriety. Mark, acting with military precision, distributed tasks among the group ordering Garnett and Roberta to check the building while the rest inspected the vehicle to ensure it could be started at any moment. Although they felt some discontent, they didn't voice their objections and followed Mark's instructions. At that moment, Roberta seemed to have discovered something. She asked Garnett if he heard it too a faint sound of a crying baby. Slowly the sound got louder and louder and they looked over at the abandoned car and saw a small baby in the back seat staring up at the ceiling with big eyes. Roberta let down her guard and opened the car door to assess the situation. It appeared that the driver had suffered a gunshot to the head, but they couldn't determine what had transpired. Roberta picked up the child, who was surprisingly well-behaved and adorable with their clean appearance. Garnett swiftly took the baby from her, expressing his desire to adopt the child. Roberta didn't understand how they could proceed with a child in tow, but Garnett paid no attention. 
He had always adapted to circumstances as they unfolded. The three individuals inspecting the vehicle surveyed their surroundings in confusion. After a thorough search, they discovered a group of zombies surrounding an iron cage on the side of a building. Armed with their weapons, they charged towards the zombies and eliminated them within a couple of minutes. To their surprise, a woman was crouching inside the cage. Mac tapped on the railing and called out to her, but the woman didn't respond. He had no choice but to pry open the lock and open the door. Stepping inside, Mac tapped the woman's shoulder, but to his astonishment, she suddenly attacked. Next to Addie rushed to say don't do it we are good people just saved you. After hearing this the woman calmed down a bit she slowly stepped back and said I'm sorry I don't know where I was just now I must have fallen asleep. Doc couldn't believe that someone could sleep in such an environment. They then found their way to a nearby house to take a rest. Mark, still wary of the unfamiliar woman, asked her why she had been locked in a cage and if she had done something wrong. The woman's response was peculiar. She said she had locked herself in to hide from the zombies and had lost the key. According to her account, the military had arrived at this location and shot many survivors. The commotion had also attracted a horde of zombies, leading to the area's downfall. While they were discussing, Roberta looked out of the doorway and noticed zombies approaching from 200 meters away. Mark immediately called them to action, instructing Mac and the others to gather food and weapons. He then turned to Garnett and instructed him to protect Murphy and the child. Inside the house while he and Roberta prepared to go out and kill the zombies, they were to regroup at this location in five minutes. After Mark finished speaking, he turned to open the door, but the remaining individuals stood motionless, exchanging glances. They were displeased at being treated as subordinates. Mark, noticing their lack of response, turned back and approached them with the demeanor of dealing with new recruits. It was only when he shouted at them that they finally moved. Soon, Addie and the others arrived at an open area, their task being to search for supplies, particularly checking the bodies for anything useful. Unbeknownst to them, a sniper was aiming at them, and they remained completely unaware. Doc spotted a hatchet and was excitedly about to pull it out as a weapon, the others rushed over to help, but they couldn't find a suitable angle to attack, fearing they might accidentally hurt Doc. Just as they grew anxious, a loud explosion rang out, blowing a big hole in the zombies' heads. Meanwhile, inside the house, Garnett was watching the adorable child. Murphy, however, seems to have heard a noise, but he's a bit of a coward. Afraid of the zombies outside, Garnett had to approach the door with his weapon to check it out. It was very quiet as he approached and he wondered if Murphy had misheard. A man holding a hammer approached the door to see if there were any zombies outside. Garnett is so fierce that he kills the zombies as they come in. Meanwhile, Murphy was hiding in a corner, trembling and showing no intention of helping. Even when the child was in danger, Murphy didn't dare to intervene, only calling out to Garnett. Garnett swiftly and decisively dealt with the zombies with his hammer. At that moment, a few more zombies walked in from outside, and Garnett swung his hammer with all his might, determined to protect the child from harm. Garnett seemed to be consumed by rage, fearlessly charging forward and engaging the zombies, resulting in a gruesome scene with blood and flesh flying everywhere. Murphy watched in terror, afraid that Garnett's bloodlust would lead to his own demise. After three minutes, all the zombies were taken care of. Murphy cautiously stepped out, looking at the weak child in the crib who had stopped crying, likely due to not having eaten in a long time. Garnett had nothing but contempt for Murphy, seeing him as a cowardly and self-preserving person. Just then, Roberta and the others returned and became alert upon seeing the bloody scene in the house. Mark was relieved to see that Murphy was okay. Anyone can have a problem but this guy? Roberta looked at Garnett and sensed that something was off with him. She asked concernedly and handed him a towel to wipe his face. But suddenly, they heard a growl coming from the crib, indicating that the child had likely turned into a zombie. They cautiously turned their heads and saw that the baby had indeed transformed into a zombie. Opening its eyes and lunging at them, they quickly moved to the doorway. Roberta tries to get Garnett to step in and finish off the baby that's turned into zombies. But he just can't do it. They argued about it. In the meantime, the small zombies stared at them from the dark corner. Garnett leaned against the door, panting heavily. He just couldn't bring himself to do it. Meanwhile, Mark finished his work and asked why they hadn't left yet. After some discussion, they learned that the child had turned into a zombie. Turned. <laughs> surprise, surprise. The comment spurred Garnett on, and as soon as he did, he ripped Murphy over and pressed him hard against the door. Mark immediately pointed his gun at Garnett's head, believing that Murphy was more important than anyone else in his eyes. Garnett had no choice but to release his grip, but Roberta asked if they were just going to leave like that and what they would do with the child. Doc and Murphy, 
on the other hand, lacks sympathy. Seeing zombies as just zombies, Mac and Addie, who were behind, agreed that they should at least give the child a proper farewell. Garnett took out his gun, deciding to take matters into his own hands and go inside. Mark stopped Garnett, sensing that his emotional state was unstable and suggested he stay outside while he quickly resolved the situation. Once inside the house, Mark became highly alert. He could hear the little zombie growling, but couldn't see where it was. Following the sound, he arrived at the ruins of a room where he sensed movement and immediately pulled the trigger. Unfortunately, the small zombies managed to escape. Finally, Mark locked onto the area under the car, confident that the zombies couldn't escape this time. He slowly crouched down, preparing to shoot as soon as he saw the zombies. The unexpected happened. Mark didn't react in time and was tackled down by the hidden zombies. The tragedy had occurred. Mark, who was full of life in the morning, had now become food for the zombies. Taking advantage of the opportunity, the small zombies pounced on him as well. The others outside heard the noise and rushed in. Witnessing a bloody scene, Mark couldn't even speak anymore. They raised their guns and fired at the corpse, giving Mark a final dignity. Afterward, Murphy began to make insensitive remarks again, saying that if they hadn't gone to deal with the small zombies, this wouldn't have happened. Roberta stopped them from arguing because the priority now was to plan for the future. Murphy spoke up again, suggesting that they forget about California and the vaccine. He didn't want to be a guinea pig from the start. He believed that they wouldn't have to endure Mark's bossy behavior anymore since he was dead. However, the others didn't share his view. They believed that even though Mark had died, if the vaccine research was genuine, it could potentially restore the world to its previous state. While they were arguing, it seemed like a radio transmission came through. Addie came into the house and saw the bloody walkie-talkie and picked it up. The walkie-talkie had been continuously calling for Delta X Squad. Addie took it outside and answered the call in front of everyone. Citizen Z sounded somewhat sad but immediately mentioned that he wanted to talk to their leader. Everyone's attention turned to Garnett, as they believed he had leadership qualities. Garnett didn't refuse and took the walkie-talkie. Citizen Z started talking about the mission to transport Murphy and emphasized that Garnett had to take over the bite mark plan, which involved reaching California. As the conversation progressed, the signal on both ends became unstable and eventually disconnected. They all looked at each other, unsure about what to do next. After thinking it through, Garnett decided to send Murphy to California. Despite no longer being a soldier, it was a chance to potentially save the world. They set off on their journey, not long after they left. Doc spotted the sniper who had saved him earlier. To his surprise, it was a handsome young man. Doc thanked him and suggested that if he was alone, he should join their group. Thus, the main cast gained another member, named 10K, who had set a goal to kill 10,000 zombies. Now, let's talk about who that commander is. The United States Security Agency had established a command center in the Arctic, equipped with advanced satellite technology that could monitor the entire United States. Previously, an operator named Citizen Z had given instructions to Mark to deliver DR merch to California. At that moment, the commander ordered all personnel in the command center to evacuate the Arctic in two minutes. However, Citizen Z lingered a bit longer to provide directions to Mark. When Citizen Z ran out to join the others, the plane had already left the Arctic, leaving him behind. Citizen Z watched as the plane flew higher and higher, disappearing into the clouds, feeling a sense of melancholy. But the next second, Citizen Z didn't make it to the plane, so he survived. And there were all kinds of survival supplies in the command post. However, the situation became awkward afterward. He lost contact with the higher-ups, and he didn't know if they had encountered any unfortunate events. The only person Citizen Z could still contact was Mark. But just now, Citizen Z learned that Mark had died, and after finally getting Garnett to take over the mission, the contact was lost again. Life was truly a series of unfortunate events for Citizen Z. The woman went crazy and drove the car into the zombies blocking the road ahead. Garnett, who was next to her, tried to persuade her to slow down, but Roberta was extremely excited. They were the ex-team escorting Murphy to California. However, as they continued walking, the truck in front of them stopped because it ran out of gas. Doc's pickup truck started emitting white smoke, as if the tires had burst. He took out some tools to repair it, but Mac warned them to be cautious as there were strangers approaching in the distance. In the apocalypse, encountering such situations required vigilance, as sometimes humans could be more terrifying than zombies. They all placed their hands on their weapons, remaining on guard. Only Cassandra, the newly joined member, quietly hid behind the vehicle. 
Seemingly not wanting to be seen by the newcomers, they began to speed off into the distance, not sure if it was because of Roberta's threat. After they left, Roberta and Doc continued repairing the front wheel. Upon inspection, they discovered that the tire was fine, but the axle seemed to be the problem, causing it to be immovable. It wasn't until they removed the tire that they were disgusted by what they found inside it was a trapped zombie, explaining why the wheel had difficulty turning. After fixing the vehicle, they arrived at their next destination, New Jersey, hoping to find gasoline there. However, after searching around, they realized that all the fuel tanks had already been emptied. Just as they were discussing their next plan, a figure emerged from a gap in the car it was one of the men they had encountered earlier, Travis. He explained that his companions had stolen his motorcycle and left him behind. In order to survive, he had been following them and requested temporary shelter from Roberta and the others. To show his sincerity, Travis provided them with some information. He revealed that there was an unimaginable amount of gasoline in a nearby refinery. Not far away, Garnett listened with some interest and asked Travis to lead the way. If it was true he could get him to follow them, they set off towards the refinery. Meanwhile, in the Northern Arctic Command Center, Citizen Z detected that the California laboratory was under siege by zombies and nearly overrun. A researcher managed to contact Citizen Z and informed him that the facility was surrounded by a group of fourth-level infected individuals, and the defense had been breached. To make matters worse, there were high-voltage electrical wires on the perimeter fence, preventing the surviving individuals from leaving. Citizen Z assured them to hold on, as he had the technical capability to remotely disable the power grid. However, before Citizen Z could complete the operation, the zombies had already stormed into the room. The researcher couldn't wait any longer and ran out when the zombies weren't looking. Unfortunately, their communication was completely cut off. No one at the California lab was responding, and Citizen Z was frantic. Murphy hadn't even been delivered yet, and the lab had fallen. To add to the frustration, Citizen Z couldn't contact Roberta and her group either. Meanwhile, Roberta and her team had arrived at the refinery. The alleyway seemed quiet, with no apparent danger, but when they stop, they see that this place should be called a zombie factory. A large number of zombies were queuing and slowly climbing the stairs towards the highest point. It was quite a spectacle. After observing the scene, they deduced that the sound of the refinery's water pump continuously attracted the zombies to gather there. The area was permeated with the smell of gasoline and the stench of zombies, indicating that they couldn't use firearms here as it could cause an explosion. Their immediate task was to stop the damn noise and then lure the zombies to another location. Addy and Mac volunteered to shut down the machine. Cassandra pulled out a music box, indicating that its high pitch could distract the zombies. Indeed, as soon as the sound started, several zombies turned their heads towards them. It seemed that the method was effective. At that moment, Roberta noticed a tanker truck in the distance, filled with enough fuel to get them to California. They proceeded with their plan. Doc's sole mission was to drive with Murphy to the safe zone. Cassandra's side is on the move. She's traveling through the zombies. Travis has been following her. There must be a secret between them. Addy and Mac made their way to the elevated platform. Fortunate that these were just low-level zombies, appearing rather sluggish due to the sound from above. After a 10-minute rampage, they reached the top floor. The machines there were indeed operational, occasionally spewing fire, which explained why they attracted so many zombies. Mac examined the machine and found that the brake button was broken. The continuous fire eruptions were due to excessively high pressure in the pipelines, the exact cause of which was unknown. They had no choice but to find something to jam it, but there was nothing around. Just then, Mac looked towards Addy's baseball bat, but Addy immediately refused. There was no other choice for Mac but to use the shovel in his hand. He took a deep breath and waited for the right moment. As expected, the machine didn't make any more noise. The advancing zombies also stopped in their tracks. Looking around in confusion, Cassandra quickly pulled out a music box from another direction. Roberta and Garnett below smiled. Their plan had succeeded. However, they had overlooked one problem where did the zombies that had climbed to the highest level go before they arrived? At that moment, a zombie happened to approach Addy from behind. To their surprise, the zombie fell into a pipe. Curious. They took a look, and it sent shivers down their spines. The pipe was filled with hordes of zombies. This explained why the pressure in the pipes had increased. The man picked up a wooden stick, took a deep breath and found the right moment to jab it into the gears. The machinery in the refinery immediately came to a halt. Without the roaring noise as a guide, the zombies below instantly stopped in their tracks, standing dumbfounded in place. Only one zombie quietly approached them, but Mac noticed it in time. Before they could take action, however, 
The zombie fell into the pipe. They looked inside and were horrified by the sight. All the zombies that had climbed to the elevated platform had fallen into the pipe. No wonder the pressure in the refinery had been consistently high. Just as they were discussing the situation, the jammed gear violently shook. The wooden stick was crushed and flew out, scratching Mac's face. To make matters worse, as the machinery resumed its operation, the noise attracted the zombies again, completely drowning out the music box in Cassandra's hands. One by one, the zombies turned back and continued towards the highest level. Unable to do anything, Addie reluctantly abandoned her baseball bat for now. The effect was immediate, and the zombies stopped once again. They didn't linger on the upper levels for long. Quickly returning to the ground to regroup with their teammates, they explained the situation to them. Garnett, upon hearing the situation, felt a chill down his spine. They needed to hurry and fill up the tanker truck. Delays could lead to unexpected consequences. Roberta honked the horn to signal the others. Cassandra placed the music box at the entrance of the drainage pipe, immediately drawing the attention of the zombies towards another direction. Seeing that it was effective, Roberta hit the gas pedal and quickly drove the vehicle forward. Garnett held the pipe securely in place. Max swiftly flipped the switch, and gasoline began to flow into the tanker. They finally breathed a sigh of relief. Everything was going according to plan. Meanwhile, in the nearby vehicle, Doc and Murphy were chatting. Suddenly, a zombie appeared outside the glass, clawing and snarling. Murphy's face paled as he was filled with panic, haunted by the memory of being attacked by eight zombies before. Doc tried to reassure him that it was just a couple of small zombies, and they were separated by the glass. But Murphy was still scared. Doc had no choice but to open the door and go out to deal with the zombies outside. Murphy still thinks he's in danger, so he locks the car door. Doc was ready to take care of the zombies one by one. After dealing with one zombie, he rushed up to kill the zombie on the hood. However, another zombie lunged from the side, wearing a helmet that prevented Doc from killing it. The person attacking was none other than 10K, who had initially taken the high ground. At this moment, Murphy was overwhelmed with fear. Just as Doc finished speaking, he fumbled with the car keys, trying to escape. The vehicle behind them suddenly surged forward. Back at the refinery, Cassandra held the music box, playing the music. Travis got closer to her and said, This is good. We'll wait for these idiots to fill up the tanker and then we'll steal it, and they'll be rewarded for their efforts. It was evident that they knew each other. However, Cassandra seemed eager to distance herself from Travis and didn't want to go back to that organization. Travis threatened Cassandra, saying that if she didn't listen to him, he would reveal her true identity to their friends and see if they would accept her. Cassandra didn't want to get entangled with Travis anymore and decided to run away, preparing to leave the area. But before she could take a few steps, she reached a dead end. Travis blocked Cassandra's escape route. Travis wore a smug expression as he slowly approached Cassandra, pulling out a weapon he had on him. He lunged at Cassandra, shocking her neck with an electric shock and then striking her abdomen. Ordinary people would have collapsed and fallen to the ground, but Cassandra seemed unfazed. Cassandra kicked Travis down, and what awaited him was being slowly devoured by the zombies. Roberta and the others also had an accident. The decompression valve gear got stuck, causing the pressure to continuously rise. The entire machine started trembling, on the verge of collapse. They gazed nervously at the zombie-covered pipeline. The consequences would be unimaginable if the pipeline burst open. Garnett quickly made the decision for them to get on the car and leave the area. The car had enough fuel to last a long time, but before they could leave, the pipeline couldn't withstand the pressure and the valve burst open. One by one, the zombies rushed out from the inside, and they were horrified at the sight. The zombies stood up and stared at them with empty eyes, wrapped in black oil. They appeared even more eerie and terrifying. They took a deep breath and picked up iron rods from the ground, preparing for the fight. But deep down, they were already filled with fear. The zombies slowly approached them, growling as if they wanted to devour everything in front of them. Roberta tried to remove the oil pipeline, but it was stuck and wouldn't come out. The zombies were getting closer, their roars echoing in their ears, as if they wanted to consume them. Luckily, Garnett assisted and managed to pull the pipe out. Now. Their priority was to leave this place. However, at that moment, Murphy, the fool, appeared. In an attempt to get rid of the zombies on the windshield, he drove the car back to the oil refinery. To their astonishment, the car crashed into the iron scaffolding. The surrounding zombies were no longer interested in Garnett and the others. They were now drawn to the loud noise and surrounded the car. Garnett instructed the others to evacuate while he went to rescue Murphy who was crucial to saving the world. Garnett swiftly dealt with a few zombies on the other side of the car. Open the door, 
and pulled Murphy out, but Murphy was terrified, his mouth mumbling incoherently, refusing to leave the car. Moreover, the collision on the car created sparks, making the situation even more urgent. Garnett gave Murphy two punches and then dragged him away. They hadn't gone far when the tanker truck exploded. They sighed, realizing that their efforts had been in vain. The burning zombies approached them, and Murphy feels no guilt whatsoever, as if he doesn't know what a mistake he's made. The disdain in their eyes made Murphy realize his mistake immediately, but all he could manage was a simple apology. At that moment, Roberta noticed Cassandra's return and was puzzled why she was the only one who came back. Cassandra said that Travis didn't survive the zombies and didn't mention their past at all. Meanwhile, at the Arctic Command Center, Citizen Z observed the explosion from the satellite and became curious. He found the team he had been searching for and used his hacking skills to call the phone booth nearby. Garnett hesitated for a moment but decided to answer the call. He quickly asked, You want us to take this guy all the way to California? That's too far. We need a closer location. Send someone to pick him up. Garnett also demanded to speak with the leader at the California laboratory. However, Citizen Z awkwardly revealed that he had lost contact with them too. The area had been overrun by zombies, and he didn't know if anyone had survived. Garnett just drops the phone. What kind of shit mission is this? As another explosion occurred at the oil refinery, Addy's baseball bat miraculously flew towards them. It was an unexpected stroke of luck since Addy cherished that weapon, while the rest of the team was feeling down and preparing to leave. 10K returned with two buckets of oil, bringing joy to Doc, who was almost brought to tears. Currently, this makeshift team had no specific goal, although they had initially intended to save humanity by escorting Murphy to California. The distance was too far, and they didn't even know if the laboratory still existed. They could only take one step at a time. Moreover, Cassandra had secrets, but no one bothered to inquire. In the post-apocalyptic world, everyone had done things they didn't want to mention. After they left, a man arrived at the refinery. One of Travis' companions, accompanying him was a middle-aged man wearing sunglasses. Tobias, the leader of a mysterious group. They looked at the dead Travis and guessed that Cassandra was responsible. Cassandra definitely has secrets, and Travis came to find her. She has been evading control from her previous organization. The gang is in Philadelphia, led by Tobias, a complete psychopath. He created a so-called family, where everyone who joins becomes his child. He provides fresh meat for his children, which is considered a luxury in the outside world. However, if you look closely, you'll notice that the men who join are strong and muscular while the women were revealing clothing and heavy makeup. And this numb woman is Tobias' wife and the mother of this family. But these women are not his lovers. They are used to entertain guests. Cassandra was once in the same situation. She was forced to entertain survivors from the outside world. For example, a man could play with her for just three drugs. This seemingly surface-level exchange was actually a scam without any substance, just as the man was lost in his own world. Cassandra pulled out a stun gun from under the pillow and launched a surprise attack. However, the man quickly grabbed hold of her. That's when Tobias appeared. The man was furious, knowing that he had fallen into a trap. Tobias' eldest son, Samuel, was knocked down with a single blow. Just as things were critical, Cassandra attacked from behind, helping to resolve the situation. Once the chaos settled, Tobias stood up sternly, reaching out for the stun gun and giving the man who had attacked him a couple of shocks. After finishing this, he turned to Cassandra. Cassandra would be punished with an electric device almost every time she made a mistake here. Later on, business became increasingly difficult, and Cassandra was even placed in a cage on the streets of a neighboring city, waiting for a big catch. Unexpectedly, she encountered the Addy Doc team by chance. These people had nothing else in mind for Cassandra, so she had the idea of leaving with them too. Not wanting to go back to being humiliated again, Tobias was extremely displeased when he learned about this. He and family members said, There's a hole in my heart. A hole in this family. Our family's not complete. Our sunshine is missing. The circle that keeps us safe is broken. While they were having a meal, the zombies outside the main gate began roaring, indicating someone's arrival. It was Samuel. He murmurs in Tobias' ear that he has found Cassandra's whereabouts. The X-Team had indeed arrived in Philadelphia and saw the zombies feasting as soon as they arrived. Cassandra, however, was burdened with her thoughts, and no one knew what she was thinking. As they walked, they stumbled upon something incredible. It was the historic bell that symbolized freedom in Philadelphia. Of course, in the apocalypse, this artifact was practically worthless. Roberta checked the car and found gasoline inside. 
they immediately decided to drive away. Two years after the virus outbreak, almost all the car batteries were dead, but that didn't pose a problem for Mac, who easily fixed it. They continued on their way with the big clock. Sometimes, Z Nation felt like a comedy with many interesting dialogues. Hey, take it easy there. That's the last of your water. Well, actually, it's the last of her water. A car appeared in front of them and Roberta swerved to the left. Although they avoided the accident, the trailer seemed to lose control due to inertia. The rope holding the big clock was thrown off and smashed right into some zombies. They all watched in astonishment. Doc even said he would pay to watch the performance again. Now, the car they just found has a bad bearing and they all pile into the pickup again. After traveling for a while, they stopped to eat and replenish their energy. It was their last bit of food. Murphy was so hungry that he started licking the packaging. After this meal, they didn't know where the next one would come from. Garnett came out and assigned tasks. He paired Addy and Mac together to find a way to contact the person at the command center through a radio. The rest of the people split into two teams and dispersed to search for food. They would regroup here in one hour, but they didn't realize that someone was secretly watching them. Undoubtedly, it was Tobias and his family members. After a while, Addy and Mac were walking down the street when they happened to see a police car with a radio inside. The two of them playfully flirted and coordinated with each other, preparing to take care of the zombies inside the car. Mac quietly tapped on the glass to attract attention and then abruptly opened the door, while Addie swung her baseball bat perfectly in sync. Soon after, Mac noticed a few zombies approaching from a distance and prepared to go and deal with them. Addie sat in the car, placed her portable camcorder on the front seat, and began checking the equipment. At the same time, Doc and the others were setting up an antenna to provide convenience for Addie's radio on their end. But just then, while Cassandra was keeping watch, she suddenly saw Samuel walking towards their location. He was definitely here to capture her and take her back. Cassandra couldn't just sit and wait, and she didn't want to endanger her two companions either, so she decided to escape directly. Samuel pursued her relentlessly since his father had instructed him not to let Cassandra get hurt. When Cassandra reached a corner and turned, the zombies, hearing the commotion, turned their attention to them and lunged. Samuel, who failed to complete his mission, arrived at the rooftop to report. After Tobias finished speaking, he looked through his binoculars again, believing that there were other gains to be made today. Tobias was looking in the direction where Addy was in the police car. Just then, as Addy finished connecting the antenna, she heard a crackling sound from the radio. With a hopeful mindset, Addy loudly exclaimed from inside the car, This is Delta X Squad, Command Center. Do you copy? Citizen Z quickly detected the signal and grew excited responding that he was there all along. Upon hearing the response, Addy also became thrilled. But suddenly, Citizen Z heard a strange sound, a kind of choking gasp. He continued to call and all he got in response was noise. In fact, it's because Samuel followed Tobias' orders to take the woman away, so that they could have more family members to pick up their clients. Citizen Z realized something was wrong and kept calling for Addy. But unfortunately, there was no response. It took another 10 minutes for Mac to get to the police car and call out if Addie was done. But then he looked in the car and tensed up. Addie was missing, but her weapons were still there. That's when he saw a female zombie, and his heart sank. Just as he finished dealing with the zombies, a call came through the radio. Mac rushed over to answer it. Mac, without bothering to confirm the identity of the person on the radio, immediately asked if there was a woman who had been talking here earlier and where she had gone. Citizen Z. Realizing that something had gone wrong, solemnly replied, We only exchanged a few words, and then strange sounds came through. It didn't sound like zombies. It seemed like she was attacked by humans. That's the situation. Citizen Z wanted to inquire about Murphy's well-being, but Mac, consumed with finding Addy, had no interest in answering these questions. His only thought was to locate Addy. Mac ran a few meters before remembering that Addy's camcorder was still in the car. If he checked the footage, he might be able to identify who was responsible. Meanwhile, Addie woke up but found herself surrounded by darkness. The man beside her removed the hood from her head. Tobias reassured Addie not to be afraid. As the people here were good, they had resorted to force only out of necessity. Tobias, instead of being angry, kindly invited Addie to join his extended family and played a piano piece as an apology. Three minutes later, the music ended, and Tobias instructed someone to untie Addie and proceeded to brainwash her. He said, I am the father in this family, we take care of each other, and everyone is for me, and I am for everyone, this has been our way of surviving for the past three years. He gave a gentlemanly wave of his hand, gesturing for Addy to enjoy the meat on the table, which was a luxury in these days. Tobias wasn't offended, 
He thought the woman would eat when she was hungry, he then called two other women from the family to take Addie and provide her with a new set of clothes. Seemingly confident, Tobias believed that Addie would become attached to this place once she became familiar with it and wouldn't want to leave. Fifteen minutes later, Addie descended from the RV wearing a sexy outfit and heavily made-up face, appearing alluring and captivating. However, she felt like a post-apocalyptic stripper in her own mind. Just as Addie was mentally complaining, Tobias's voice sounded out he was barbecuing. Dinner time was approaching, so he instructed the other two women to make room for Addie. Addie, with a melancholic expression, wondered why Mac hadn't come to rescue her yet. She decided to take a stroll and observe this strange place, hoping to find a way to escape. Then she suddenly noticed a pipe next to her that led to nowhere. As she lifted the curtain, it was dimly lit inside, and she used her lighter to illuminate the area. She discovered medical equipment and various tools scattered around after casually turning on the lights. Furrowing her brows, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about this place. On the table, there were all sorts of props, including an electronic scale. It was truly eerie. Addie immediately associated this with the meat Tobias had given her and suspected that it was processed here. The woman sighed and bravely lifted the white cloth on the table. Before she could recover, a sobbing sound came from underneath. The man struggled continuously, seemingly seeking help. Addie's breathing became rapid as she abruptly pulled aside the nearby curtain, and what she saw made her heart almost jump out of her chest. These men were also wrapped up tightly with their arms and legs missing. Addie could hardly believe that those sick individuals outside were actually consuming human flesh for their meals, and they were being kept alive by nutrient solution to ensure the freshness of the meat. Addie covered her mouth and ran out just as Tobias came and hugged her. Tobias wasn't surprised by Addie's discovery but smiled. Meanwhile, inside Philadelphia, Doc and the others found some supplies and returned to the designated meeting point with everyone. Roberta and the others stared directly at Cassandra. Though Mac's tone was calm, it carried a hint of anger as he handed over the video for Cassandra to watch, showing the scene of Addie being abducted, and that long-haired man was none other than the motorcycle rider they had encountered before. Roberta says, We knew you knew them before. Cassandra immediately denied, claiming she didn't know these people at all. Mac's temper flared up. He directly pressed the gun against her head threatening her to quickly confess the truth and reveal the whereabouts of those people. Garnett tried to persuade Mac to calm down and gently question Cassandra. At that moment, 10K killed a zombie, but in that split second, Cassandra took off running. She simply didn't want to return to that hellish place. Eventually, they intercepted Cassandra in an underground tunnel. With no other choice, Cassandra confessed everything. She admitted not only knowing them but also being a part of their group in the past. Her words revealed a deep fear of Tobias. Seeing Cassandra in this state, Mac and the others couldn't help but worry, bombarding her with questions about whether they would harm Addie or even kill her. No, not rape, not murder! They don't just kill their victims! It's worse! They returned to the vehicle to discuss their next move. Garnett was still unwilling to believe that those people could actually consume human flesh because once a person dies, the zombie virus takes over their body. But Cassandra told them that Tobias had thought about that too, and that's why he ate live human flesh. After hearing this, they looked at each other in disbelief. Unable to fathom the horror, Murphy, frightened, shouted to leave and abandon Addie, but he was rebuked by the others. They would never leave a comrade behind, Tobias accompanied by his family, was enjoying a dinner, cutting pieces of human flesh. Seeing Addie crying in fear Tobias says in all seriousness, don't look at me like that, I couldn't do it at first either but hunger leaves no choice. In other words, it was no different from the law of the jungle among animals. The man had only come to have fun, but he hadn't expected to get himself killed, and he writhed in agony. Tobias gives the man a backhanded electric shock. After knocking him out, Tobias continues to cut into the man's thigh. Addie felt nauseous but dared not make any move. She was torn about whether or not to accept the meat offered by Tobias. Just as Addie was struggling, Byrne approached and reported that there was new prey arriving. Tobias reluctantly instructed Samuel to clean up the table and prepare to receive the newcomers. As usual, the person who arrived was Garnett. He stood at the entrance of the camp, with his hands raised, and straightforwardly stated that he came here in search of the redhead woman, who was their friend. Byrne shook his head, 
claiming to have never heard of this person, and even introduced two seductive women behind him, asking Garnett about his preferences. We got a two-for-one special today. Listen, scumbag. I know you got her. You send her out here in the next 10 seconds or a lot of bad shit's gonna start happening. Ooh, tough guy. <laughs> Inside the camp, the people laughed at the threat in Garnett's words. <laughs> 10K had already taken a vantage point, waiting for Garnett's command. Garnett remained calm and continued, stating that this was just an appetizer. If they didn't hand over their friend, the next bullet would pierce through Burns' heart. He dared them to try. Seeing the tense situation, Tobias emerged with Addy by his side. He stated that he could let this woman go, but they would need Cassandra in exchange. Otherwise, they would all perish together. Garnett hadn't anticipated such strong resistance from the other side. As they seemed unfazed by their threats, he had no choice but to hold back for now. However, Tobias didn't compromise because his man had positioned heavy machine guns at higher ground. With a single command from Tobias, Garnett would be turned into a pile of shredded meat. Garnett was unsure of what to do in that moment. Mac, who was hiding nearby, is desperate to help. But Cassandra stops Mac. This situation had arisen because of her, and she decided to take responsibility. Cassandra walked to the entrance of the camp. In this way, Cassandra traded herself for Addy. Despair filled Cassandra's eyes, as she knew she would be returning to a life devoid of hope. To prevent any mishaps, Garnett and his group quickly left the area. Addy was happy to get away. She couldn't imagine what it would be like to be forced to receive guests. They regrouped at the location of the vehicles in Philadelphia. After adjusting their moods, they all got into their vehicles, preparing to continue their journey towards California. Addy stood still, unable to understand how they could just abandon Cassandra like that. Mac quickly approached her and tried to convince her, saying that there was no point in caring about that woman since all of this happened because of her. The rest of the group agreed, stating that Cassandra was just a cannibal and it wasn't worth risking their lives for her. Deep down, though, they both feel a little guilty about leaving Cassandra behind. Now that Roberta supported Addy, the others didn't object any further, but if they were to go back and rescue Cassandra, the threat of Tobias' heavy machine guns was too daunting. They'll be blown to bits before they even get close. Roberta, with a determined attitude, closed the door and then asked 10K, how good is your marksmanship? 10K didn't say a word but demonstrated his skills through actions. Roberta's first step is to contact Citizen Z at the command center. She asked Citizen Z to play loud music on the radio channel specifically a high-frequency and high-volume type that would drive the zombies insane. Citizen Z immediately agreed, mainly because he was attracted to Addy's charming voice and finally had someone who needed his help. Being alone in the Arctic was incredibly dull. Back at the cannibal camp, Cassandra was brought back and surprisingly faced no punishment. Tobias ordered her to feed her mother. That's when Burnt came in to report that a customer had taken the bait, specifically stating that an exotic woman was needed. No doubt Cassandra will be the only one to receive the new guests. The RV door opened, and an elderly man wearing sunglasses looked at them. Cassandra was surprised to see Doc but cleverly concealed her emotions. It wasn't until the door closed that Cassandra asked Doc what he was doing there. Doc signaled her to keep her voice down and temporarily play along with him, waiting for the right moment for them to escape together. Meanwhile, Roberta and the group found a large speaker to install under their vehicle. The tremendous sound of music immediately attracted the surrounding zombies. About 10 minutes later Tobias and Samuel were outside the caravan. They marveled at how much noise the old man was making. In reality, they were just making noises inside and shaking the car. Just then, Tobias faintly heard the music and ordered his two subordinates to go out and see who the idiot was playing songs. Doc heard the music and knew it was the signal for their plan to proceed. He immediately started screaming, creating the illusion that Cassandra was attacking him. Upon hearing the commotion, Tobias instructed Samuel to rush inside. As they entered the bedroom, they found no one there. Tobias was fortunate to be only shot in the arm. He pinned Doc to the ground. Cassandra burst out and made sure Tobias experienced the taste of electric shock. With Tobias taken care of, they ran out of the RV. By this time, the music was blaring, reaching the sky. Tobias' men were too preoccupied with preparing weapons for the imminent crisis, completely unaware of the peculiar situation here. Three minutes later the ground shook, the car led a swarm of zombies, and the people inside the camp couldn't even think of resisting when they saw it. The machine gunner on top immediately opened fire, preventing the zombies from entering the camp. But at that moment, 10K also found his position and sent him to his death with a bullet that even penetrated the gas pipe behind him. Doc and Cassandra didn't hesitate and quickly jumped into a pickup truck. 
Escaping before the zombies could surround the area, with no further obstacles, the horde of zombies charged straight towards the camp. Tobias, still feeling a bit numb, looked at the approaching zombies and quickly rushed into a nearby pipeline to take cover. As soon as he entered, the food supplies in the pipeline started making noise, immediately attracting the attention of the zombies outside. Tobias anxiously hid among the food, praying that the zombies wouldn't come inside. As the zombies rushed in, his fate was sealed. 30 seconds later, Tobias's screams echoed, and the cannibals were wiped out. Meanwhile, the X team had already made their way through the city. After this incident, their bond grew stronger. Cassandra also let go of her guard and truly integrated into the group. Hope my peeps down in the Philly area can hear this. Thought I'd spend some blues to travel by. And to anybody else out there within the sound of my voice, I hope some slide guitar gets you through another messed up day of death and destruction. Everybody out there, whether you're hiding in a cave or running for your life, just keep doing what you gotta do to stay alive. Because in the end, that's the only way we're gonna win this zombie apocalypse thing. Bash them, slash them, bust them, and burn them. Whatever it takes, just stay alive. No questions asked. A group of zombies appeared on the road, blocking the path of the vehicle. In the apocalyptic world, this was not a major concern, but 10K was alert and quickly jumped down to hide in the perimeter, without much thought. Garnett led his team to get off the vehicle and clear the zombies. He didn't want the only car they had to be destroyed. Armed with a long knife, Roberta swiftly beheaded the closest zombie, but soon they realized something was wrong. The zombie's feet were chained, indicating that someone intentionally placed them there. Suddenly, the situation became clear. They had encountered a group of bandits who intended to rob them. The lead bandit grinned confidently, urging them to either surrender their weapons or die right there. Garnett hesitated, unsure whether to resist or not. Suddenly, 10K, who was hiding nearby, took action. The lead bandit tried to maintain composure, stating that if they engaged in a fight, both sides would suffer. He claimed that the sniper might kill one or two of them, but guaranteed that their group would be wiped out. Listening to the bandit's threat, Roberta instructed her team to remain cautious. However, Murphy, the coward, persuaded Garnett to surrender their weapons and prioritize survival. Both sides found themselves at a standoff, neither daring to make the first move. In fact, the bandits were also nervous, fearing that these individuals might fight back fiercely, just as the battle was about to break out. Garnett made the final decision. The lead bandit breathed a sigh of relief. They had won the psychological game and promptly ordered their comrades to get in the car and speed away. Left on the road, Garnett and his team felt frustrated. The car they carefully protected even had two barrels of oil in it, so it was too frustrating to be robbed by these bastards. They didn't want to walk, so they had to drive the broken beetle, but even the door had fallen off. In this manner, the eight of them squeezed into the almost scrapped beetle and moved forward on the road, resembling a tortoise. But they hadn't gone far when they encountered another problem ahead. Once again, those bastards were robbing a family with children. It was unbelievable how they had no moral standards. Enraged, they charged forward with their weapons. Realizing that the situation was hopeless, the lead bandit had his men put down their guns. Garnett suddenly noticed that the number of bandits had significantly decreased. When he turned around, he saw the remaining bandits all kneeling obediently in front of her. The sudden turn of events caught Roberta and the others off guard, until the man pointed his gun at them and told them to put it down again. What kind of situation was this? As it turned out, that seemingly weak family were also bandits. Considering their earlier assistance, they didn't immediately kill them. They drove off in their car. The mood of the X team was extremely gloomy. It had been an utterly terrible day. Roberta also felt that nothing had gone right today. The small beetle car continued its journey. After traveling for another five minutes, Doc signaled Roberta to stop. There was another new development ahead. They saw the family again, but they were dead, being eaten by zombies. They had no idea what had happened. It's a weird road. Meanwhile, in the Arctic Command Center, Citizen Z was using social software to track down a person, Addy. Ever since hearing Addy's voice last time, Citizen Z had been deeply captivated by her. Just as he was immersed in studying the information, a call signal appeared on the large screen. Upon opening it, he saw that it was Garnett and the others. They'd found a device on the side of the road, and it took them a long time to get it on the radio. Citizen Z immediately asked Addy to talk. 
Garnett was confused but didn't think much of them for a while. While they were chatting, Garnett approached and mentioned that the road was not safe. He asked if the military could provide them with an aerial transport because they had no idea when they would reach California at this rate. Citizen Z quickly checked and found a military base nearby. A general had been stationed there, but they had lost contact with him. Fortunately, there was a military helicopter at the base. He immediately provided them with the location, with zombies already approaching, they had to leave the area without delay. An hour later, they arrived at the military base. However, it was different from what they had imagined. Dead soldiers were scattered everywhere, and there was no one on duty or standing guard. Could it be that the place had fallen? Suddenly a man with a gun asks what they're doing here. Garnett stated their National Guard identity and explained that they were on an important mission from the Central Command, seeking to borrow a helicopter from General McCandles, but the soldiers scoffed and mocked them, stating that General McCandles was busy commanding the East Coast operations and had no time for a ragtag civilian guard. Roberta held her tongue and told him how important Murphy was to the research. The soldier fell silent, realizing that this was beyond his authority. He then spoke up saying that if they wanted to see General McCandles, they needed to show some sincerity, such as valuable painkillers or antibiotics. Doc had no choice but to bring out his best OxyContin, but the soldier was incredibly greedy and one pill was not enough. Doc could only suppress his temper and hand over a few more, but he didn't expect the soldier to swallow them. They cursed in their hearts. They thought the medicine was for treating the wounded, but they didn't realize that the soldier was a drug addict. As the soldier indulged in the drugs, he led them to the entrance and used the radio to communicate with General McCandles. But General McCandles, lacking any manners, responded with profanity and told them to get lost. Garnett tried to argue and explain the importance of their mission, but he was once again rejected. Doc was furious that the soldier had taken his medication in exchange for this, and said he was going to hit the soldier. Just as Garnett shouted Doc's name, General McCandles misheard it as the pronunciation of the word doctor. Garnett, seizing the opportunity, played along and indicated that Doc was indeed their doctor. General McCandles' attitude suddenly changed, and he instructed Doc to treat the injured soldier. Afterward, Doc, carrying a medical bag, entered the building, which surprisingly had an elevator. He's not really a doctor, but when he was younger Doc used to do a lot of drugs and knew a lot about them. Just as Doc was grumbling, the elevator stopped, and the doors opened to reveal General McCandles aiming a gun at him. General McCandles rolled up his pants, revealing that he himself was the injured soldier. Doc looked at it and saw a nasty wound, not from a zombie bite but not good either. General McCandles clung to a glimmer of hope and asked if Doc could save his leg. Shaking his head, Doc indicated that there was no other option. The virus had already started to spread, and amputation was the only choice. He used the butt of his gun to strike Doc and then threw him down a ventilation shaft. Luckily Doc grabbed a few of the tubes to save his life. But he looked down, if he fell from this height, he would basically be dead. He breathed a sigh of relief and at the same time seemed to smell a rotten odor. Surprisingly there was a zombies next to him that scared him so much he almost let go. He think it was the last Dr. General McCandles was talking about. And downstairs, 10K was getting bored, resorting to shooting zombies. After another half hour Doc didn't come back and the rest of them were anxious. If they didn't agree to borrow the helicopter they would leave. At that moment, Cassandra signaled for everyone to be quiet. Sensing some sound, it was Doc calling for help. He was terrified, facing the zombies that were dangerously close. They were even tugging at his clothes. Garnett realized that something had happened to Doc and directly coerced the soldier to lead the way. He prepared to lead the team inside to rescue Doc, while keeping 10k outside with a sniper rifle to guard against any zombies approaching. Soon, they all entered the elevator. According to the soldier, General McCandles resided on the top floor. However, during the elevator's ascent, Murphy became extremely fearful. He had a significant phobia of enclosed spaces. Roberta slapped him to bring him back to his senses. Meanwhile, General McCandles observed their every move through the surveillance cameras. As the elevator doors opened, they were greeted by several zombies. Garnett pushed the soldier out to buy them some time, but that's when Murphy ran straight out. He really didn't want to be in the lift anymore. The fear was even more than zombies. When the elevator doors opened again, the zombies from before were nowhere to be seen. They had undoubtedly gone after Murphy. Garnett shouts for Roberta to come with him to rescue him and the rest of us stay here to guard the lift. Inside the ventilation shaft, Doc felt like he was reaching his limit. He desperately banged on the walls with a stick, calling out for his teammates. Coincidentally, Murphy was hiding behind the wall and heard Doc's cries for help. However, 
Murphy lacked the courage and ability to save Document. Instead, he went to fetch reinforcements. Garnett and Roberta fought off numerous zombies on that floor but ran out of bullets. They had no choice but to return to the elevator and regroup with Addy. Just in case Murphy returned on his own. Murphy was just about to say something about Doc when the lift rang. They immediately took up their weapons on guard. But there was nothing inside. But when the doors opened, there was nothing inside. At that moment, they heard the growls of zombies approaching from behind. Their footsteps heavy. Emerging from the shadows was a towering, muscular zombie. Standing over two meters tall. Now Garnett and Roberta were out of bullets. Mac pulled out his handgun from his waist and rushed forward firing three consecutive shots at the zombies' heads, but it doesn't have the slightest effect on the evolved zombies. And instead Mac is lifted up by the zombies by the neck. Garnett first froze for a couple of seconds but quickly reacted and rushed forward to save Mac. He launched a series of strikes towards the zombies' heads from behind, but even after hitting them more than 10 times, he couldn't kill zombies. The zombies seemed to have some intelligence and actually pulled on Garrett's hand and wouldn't let go. Addy swiftly pushed the zombies into the ventilation shaft ensuring that the explosion wouldn't affect their current floor. Having resolved the crisis, they all breathed a sigh of relief. But, Garnett then asked Murphy, you knew where Doc was, right? He was down that air shaft. Everyone fell silent, and the atmosphere grew heavy. Addie felt particularly guilty as she had pushed the zombies down. After several tense seconds, Garnett adjusted his mood and urged them to continue searching for General McCandles. It wasn't the time to dwell on sadness. Soon, they find the conference room where the zombies are sitting in their seats. General McCandles was pretending to give orders through a radio, but in reality, everyone else was dead, and he was the only one left. As General McCandles saw the group approaching, he immediately picked up a rocket launcher and aimed it at them. He awkwardly laughed, saying it was just a joke. Garnett reiterated the importance of escorting Murphy. As it was crucial for saving humanity, they needed to reach California to develop a vaccine. Right now they need his helicopters to get there. General McCandles laughed and said, Why didn't you say so earlier? I'll personally fly the helicopter and take you there. They exchanged puzzled glances, wondering why he suddenly became so cooperative. Arriving on the rooftop, they indeed found the helicopter. But it was merely an empty shell without even the propellers. General McCandles explained that they needed to find the missing parts to make it functional. Murphy. He's so angry. He wants to punch somebody. Doc died for the shit. Just then, two zombies burst out of the helicopter. General McCandles shouted for everyone to stay still while he dealt with his former subordinates. But it ended in tragedy. Sometimes life doesn't go as planned. Waiting in the car, 10K asks where Doc is and Roberta sighs and says he's dead. 10K is a little sad that the first person he met was also Doc. Still feeling guilty, Addy suddenly sees a zombie in the distance and alerts everyone. There's a familiar figure, covered in blood. Everyone takes a look and it's Doc. 10K also looked carefully. Doc had blood all over his body and face on his weak feet had indeed turned into zombies. Roberta grabbed her pistol and mouthed the words, ready to give her old friend one last ride, the highest standard of the post-apocalyptic world. A light flashed in their eyes. Doc was alive. What the hell, Warren? You trying to kill me? You alive? Damn straight I'm alive! <laughs> <laughs> we thought you were dead. Well, so did I. Some new skull threw a grenade in an air shaft I was stuck in. They both smiled. The kind of smile you get when you see a family member come back from the dead. Doc wiped the blood off his face, and they continued on their journey, unaware of the thrilling and exciting events that awaited them. The woman swings the broom in her hand and builds up her strength to poke it towards the front. These zombies are already stunned by the high voltage on the fence, so it's easy to clean them up. They were the ex-squad on their way to California, and they happen to be taking a break in this house. Garnett and Roberta are keeping watch outside. The rest of the team is more comfortable. Doc and Murphy are playing cards and gambling. Upstairs, Addie and Mac were busy enjoying themselves, while 10K and Cassandra were fast asleep. It had been a while since they felt this secure. Indeed, it was a good place. The scattered zombies couldn't break through the electrified fence. However, the weather didn't seem friendly. Dark clouds covered the sky, 
Accompanied by the rumbling sound of thunder, half an hour later, the worst happened. Garnett and Roberta's expressions changed as they pulled out their guns and killed the approaching zombies. But the sound of gunfire attracted even more zombies. Realizing the dire situation, they quickly rushed into the house, alerting their teammates to gather their belongings and retreat. Murphy and Doc reacted the fastest and took the poker and medicine with them. 10K and Cassandra followed suit. Even Addie and Mac, who were upstairs, quickly put on their clothes and rushed out. As they headed towards the back door to leave, the zombies had already entered the house. Meanwhile, in the Arctic Command Center, Citizen Z noticed something unusual from the satellite. Opening the weather monitoring system, he was startled by what he saw. Without wasting any time, he began broadcasting over the radio, urging the survivors near the Gulf of Mexico to take shelter. As an unprecedented tornado was approaching, the consequences would be unimaginable if they didn't seek safety in advance. Some survivors became nervous upon hearing the broadcast, while others thought it was a prank and remained unaffected. Meanwhile, the X-Squad, who had left the house, was checking the abandoned cars on the roadside for any useful supplies. They also heard Citizen Z's broadcast, and he even mentioned Addy's name. The situation became urgent, and they noticed the increasingly loud thunder in the sky. Roberta suggested that instead of finding a place to take cover, they should simply drive out of the area. The others didn't understand how a car could outrun a tornado, but Roberta insisted. They couldn't argue further, so they immediately set off along the highway. However, Shortly after they left the intersection, they saw in the distance that the tornado had already formed and was accompanied by a large number of zombies. Roberta realized it was futile to continue and quickly turned the vehicle towards a nearby house. Ten minutes later they arrived in a small town called Kars. Garnett noticed that Roberta's mood became increasingly gloomy as they got closer. After inquiring, they learned that this was her former hometown. Roberta had a happy life here with her husband, who was a local firefighter. However, when the zombie outbreak began, her husband went out to help other residents and never returned. She had no choice but to flee the town. She didn't want to return to this place, but since they were already here, she wanted to see if the missing person poster she had left behind was still there. However, the poster remained unchanged. Just like two years ago, Roberta adjusted her emotions, ignoring Murphy. The most important thing now was to lead the team to take shelter from the tornado. They arrived at her former home, and there happened to be a cellar underneath which was a good refuge. Taking a deep breath, she held onto a glimmer of hope that her husband might still be inside the house. They quickly split up and searched with their weapons, but found no zombies. Mac kept banging on the door, while Roberta touched the spot where she used to keep the keys. The keys were still there. After opening the door, they rushed in and quickly checked upstairs and downstairs, but found no zombies. Roberta looked at the box on the cabinet, which contained the memories she shared with her husband. With a heavy heart, she opened it and took a look. Everything was still in place, untouched. Suddenly, they heard coughing and groaning sounds coming from inside. Roberta's first thought was that it was her husband turned into a zombie, so she took out her gun, ready to handle it herself. She cautiously approached the kitchen, but to her surprise, she found two strangers instead. The man had obviously suffered a serious head injury. The woman explained that a firefighter had saved them and told them that it was safe here. Roberta's mind raced, realizing that the firefighter could very well be her husband. Roberta quickly took out a photo and asked the woman if the man in the picture was the one who helped her. However, the woman couldn't be certain because the person who helped her was wearing a helmet. Roberta smiled. Understanding that she didn't receive a definite answer, but only her husband would have brought them to this place. By now, the weather outside was becoming increasingly severe, with the wind howling and the trees rustling. Their next step was to prepare to enter the basement. However, 10K and Cassandra had already checked the kitchen and found a stockpile of water and food but no batteries or medical supplies. Garnett believed they needed to restore communication equipment and contact Citizen Z. He instructed 10K and Cassandra to search nearby for a radio and return before the tornado arrived. As for the severely injured man, he's hallucinating and even starting to talk gibberish. Murphy, mocking as always, made sarcastic remarks. Doc suggested that if they had the right medication or a first aid kit, they might be able to save the man's life. Roberta immediately thought of the fire station where her husband used to work, as there would likely be these items there. Garnett understood Roberta's intention and instructed Mac to lock the basement and keep an eye on the man. If he turned into a zombie, they couldn't afford to show any mercy. After giving the instructions, Garnett and Roberta braved the strong winds and ran out, aiming to return before the full force of the storm hit. In reality, 
Roberta also wanted to see if she could find any traces of her husband while outside. However, their journey was not smooth, as they encountered several zombies along the way. And while they were out there, Mac and the others were getting ready, the only exception was Murphy, who felt something was off with his body. When he looked in the mirror, he noticed dark spots on his face, and his teeth showed signs of looseness. Murphy immediately realized it was the aftermath of being bitten by a zombie, the biggest nightmare he had ever faced since birth. Murphy began to panic, wondering what would happen if he turned into a zombie. To make matters worse, he lightly tugged at his hair, only to see large clumps falling out. The sky roared with thunder as a massive tornado brood, accompanied by a horde of zombies. At this moment, two figures were maneuvering through the alley, Garnett and Roberta, in search of a medical kit. Roberta was familiar with this place since it was her husband's former workplace. Soon, they arrived at the fire station, but to Roberta's disappointment, it was covered in dust, indicating that nobody had been there for a long time. She adjusted her emotions and handed Garnett the medical kit, which they hadn't used much, and it even contained anesthetics. Roberta still holds out a glimmer of hope. She decided to open her husband's personal locker, where a photo of them taken when they first became a couple was stuck on the door. Seeing Roberta feeling down, Garnett tried to console her, suggesting that her husband might still be alive and living somewhere else. Roberta smiled, but deep down, she knew the likelihood of that was slim. If her husband was alive, he couldn't have left these photos. Meanwhile, the colossal tornado was drawing closer to the town, causing the houses to tremble. They needed to hurry back, but several zombies blocked their path at the front door. Without hesitation, Roberta made the decision to lead Garnett through another door, but as soon as they opened the door, Two firefighter zombies jumped on them and they had to try to close it again. Suddenly a zombie fell behind them and the door was knocked open. Fortunately, there were only four zombies in total, and they drew their pistols to shoot. After firing just two shots, they ran out of bullets and had to resort to using their melee weapons against the zombies. Being seasoned fighters, they initially thought taking care of four zombies would be a piece of cake. However, these zombies were wearing helmets, making it difficult to land a killing blow. Luckily. Garnett managed to find a firefighting axe and used brute force to break through their defenses. Meanwhile, in the basement, Mac and the others had brought the injured man down. Unfortunately, the man's condition seemed to be worsening as he continued to speak incoherently. Doc, not being a real doctor but having seen a similar situation in a movie, suspected that the man was experiencing increased intracranial pressure, causing his brain to be overwhelmed. When asked about a solution, Doc wasn't entirely sure but suggested they needed something sharp to open up his skull and relieve the pressure. Mac calls out for Murphy to come and help, but he's startled by what comes out. And it's only when he looks closely that he recognizes Murphy. Why does this guy have a shaved head all of a sudden? And it's kind of scary. Murphy rummaged around and found a power drill and a pencil. Doc hesitated for a moment and chose the power drill, deeming it suitable for the task. He instructed Mac and the woman to hold the man down tightly and assured them not to panic if there was significant bleeding since that was necessary for releasing the intracranial pressure. Just like in the movies, they listened, somewhat bewildered. Without delay, Doc started using the power drill, slowly pressing it toward the man's head. Initially, it seemed to be going well, but then an unexpected event occurred the drill bit broke. Mac pulls out a gun and the woman stops him, hoping to save him. Doc took the butt of the gun and hit it once, twice, but it didn't seem to work. On the third attempt, he increased the force, and blood spurted out, splattering them. The man actually opened his eyes, indicating that it might have worked to some extent, but now the drill has become a problem. It's not right to pull out or not to pull out. They're out of ideas. 2. Garnett and Roberta rushed back in a fire truck as the storm approached. They had just stepped out and noticed that the massive tornado was getting closer, with some dark figures swirling within it. They had a dreadful suspicion, zombies. It was really zombies. If they were accidentally smashed to death, how wrong it would be. They didn't dare to stay and quickly ran towards the house. Garnett anxiously carried the medical kit and rushed into the basement, knowing the storm was about to hit. However, Roberta stopped in her tracks and looked at the sky, making a bold decision. She closed the basement door and dragged a sofa over, sitting on it with her wedding photo in hand and her wedding ring on her finger. She decided not to hide in the basement anymore. By now, the storm had reached the town. 10K and Cassandra, who were out searching for a radio, couldn't make it back and sought shelter inside the nearest vehicle. Their hearts were filled with unease, unsure if they could withstand the storm. At this point, they could only leave their fate in the hands of nature. Garnett realized that Roberta hadn't come down and rushed to the stairwell. 
Calling out for her, he tried pushing the door but couldn't open it. Roberta didn't say a word. Instead, she smiled. The zombie they encountered at the fire station was her husband. She felt her heart turn to ashes. When the end of the world came, she left without her husband, for which she had always felt guilty, and now she was making up for it. In the basement, a zombie crashed through the window, but its impact had rendered it immobile. Doc instructed Murphy to deal with the zombie while they sealed the breach. Murphy approached the zombie with a pencil in hand and gently poked its palm, since Murphy felt a change in his body. When he saw the zombies again, he felt a kind of affection and sympathy. He couldn't help but reach out his hand to touch the zombies. The eyes of the zombies also opened. One person and one zombie just stared at each other. Murphy was no longer afraid and even smiled gently. It was an affectionate feeling. Doc successfully removed the drill from the man's head and wrapped it with gauze from the medical kit. Mac freed his hands and approached the zombie, holding a weapon. Murphy froze for a moment. He seemed a little sad with tears in his eyes. Outside, the storm was approaching and the house was being dismantled as if it were made of paper mache. They all felt anxious in the basement, hoping to withstand the storm. Murphy, devoid of his usual fear and timidity, remained calm as he gently embraced the zombie's lifeless body. Bidding a final farewell, Cassandra nestled in Mac's arms, finding solace in the possibility that dying together would be a form of happiness. 10K and Cassandra, who were still outside, were in a precarious situation. Their vehicle was directly lifted up by the strong winds. I hope they are safe. The wind grew stronger as the tornado approached. As if the world itself was on the verge of destruction, Roberta sat calmly on the couch and let everything outside collapse. If she were to die in this catastrophe, she would be able to join her husband in heaven, if by some miracle she survived. She would let go of the past and start a new life. Gradually, all sounds around her faded away, and she faintly saw her husband, dressed in firefighting gear, returning. After the storm, the sky was as beautiful as ever, with the radiant hues illuminating the reborn earth and the surviving people. Cassandra can't calm down. The scene last night was too shocking. The people in the basement finally breathed a sigh of relief. Garnett remembered Roberta and rushed outside. He pushed open the door to find the entire house reduced to rubble, with Roberta lying amidst the debris. Fortunately, she was only unconscious. Garnett had always loved Roberta but had never expressed his feelings. He knew that she still held onto a past love. But after this incident, with no more barriers, they could truly be together. The others emerged, marveling at the destructive power of the tornado. 10K and Cassandra made it back in time and they were all relieved. After a brief half-hour rest, they prepared to set off once again. This time, they had an additional fire truck, sparing them the worry of supplies. The couple expressed their gratitude to Doc, the doctor, despite the tumultuous and bizarre circumstances. But it turned out all right. After bidding their farewells, the X-Team set off. Every difficulty brings them closer together. When the virus first broke out, some people weren't afraid of becoming zombies. Instead, they believed it was God's way of offering humanity a chance for rebirth, advocating for the acceptance of death. This belief gave rise to a sect called the Truth Church. Two years on, the faith remained unshakable for some. In the church, a priest in a white coat named Jacob claimed to be the incarnation of Jesus, sent by God to persuade more people to embrace death for rebirth. Despite the absurdity of this theory, it found fervent believers. Today, three more joined. Jacob personally adorned them with crosses, congratulating them on becoming followers of Jesus, destined to save the lost. Meanwhile, Team X, having weathered a storm in a week on the road, now starved, abandoned their fire truck. Murphy, undergoing alarming changes with dark hair sprouting on his face, increasingly resembled a zombie. This guy is taking a leak right now. The others debated behind his back whether to eliminate him and how to do it. Truth be told, Murphy wasn't exactly likable, but bound by a mission to save humanity, he was tolerated. Yet, this was a mere subplot. The journey had to continue. Ravenous, they pressed on. Garnett aimed to lead them to a community formed by his National Guard comrades, hoping for refuge. After an hour's travel, they arrived. The area appeared neat and tidy, likely a safe haven, but as they approached, armed men confronted them, ordering them to turn back. Garnett stepped out, seeking Major Williams, an old war comrade. A few moments later a man wearing a military hat came out. He was surprised to see Garnett, he didn't think he was still alive. Although they had been comrades in arms, it was the end of the world, so he had to ask what Garrett was doing here. Garnett spoke of his government mission, having traveled a year from New York, now desperate for food. Williams was shocked that he had traveled such a long distance from New York. After a brief inquiry Williams realizes that Garnett means them no harm and is prepared to treat them well. 
except that the weapons must be handed over to the guards. The group had to do what they were told in order to get a full meal. 10K's weapons are mind-boggling. How does one man have so many weapons? After going through the process, they all entered the neighborhood without incident. At this point, the woman said to Williams, Three of Jacob's flock are back. Williams sighed and said, Check them out and let them in if they're okay. After all, they used to be part of this community. Little did they know, this decision would spell catastrophic disaster for the community. The X team also took a curious look. 10K was immediately drawn to a girl, feeling an urge to know her. Williams led them on a tour of the base, boasting of its high, secure fences, never breached. He explained that problems usually arose from within, hence the no weapons policy. In the dining hall, life seemed good with an array of food. That's when they spotted the three youths again. Roberta inquired about their background. Williams reluctantly said we'd taken in a missionary. He was preaching some weird theory about the end times being a gift from God and that we should accept zombies instead of killing them. He had been expelled, but some were swayed by his words. But slowly, every once in a while, someone would come back. After all, their families were here. When they're hungry, who's going to believe those words? Before Williams could finish, Cassandra started grabbing food, driven by their intense hunger. At the table, Williams tried to persuade Garnett to stay and help manage the community instead of going to California, warning of millions of zombies out west. But Garnett refused, believing that some things in life must be done. Williams didn't say anything about it, after all, we all have our own aspirations, and he knew his old friend was a stubborn man. Meanwhile, 10K couldn't take his eyes off Mary and discreetly followed her when she left, unnoticed by the others. After eating, Roberta and Garnett excused themselves, their intentions clear to the group. They retired to a room Williams had arranged, just a bed, but enough for them. They're officially together and they're here for a little indulgence. Roberta had put a chair against the door to prevent interruptions. Patrick was talking to his former companion. What they didn't notice was that the other two returning missionaries had disappeared. One of them sneaked into the guard room. Luke, unobserved, revealed a cross hanging around his neck. Meanwhile, Mary reached the door, her steps unsteady. 10K, following her, noticed something on the ground, a cross. Puzzled, he looked up just as Mary staggered to the door causing the guard to open it with concern. 10K fiddled with the cross in his hand, revealing a hidden dagger stained with blood. That's right Mary used the hidden dagger to kill herself just to turn into zombies and make this place fall. The man who was looking for something in the janitor's room also heard the noise and rushed outside. He didn't notice that Luke's throat had been slit. He tried to help Mary but was attacked by two zombies. Meanwhile in the canteen Patrick, who thought the time was right, also took out his crucifix and stood directly on the table. Patrick loudly proclaims the theory of rebirth and urges people not to fear death, as turning into a zombie is the beginning of life. He ended his speech by slashing his own neck. Mac and the others reacted at once and quickly looked around to see if there were any weapons at hand, because Patrick was going to become zombies. The others, still unaware of the severity, faced an inevitable grim end. Patrick transformed rapidly, attacking those nearby, throwing the dining hall into chaos. Those bitten turned into zombies at an alarming rate, attacking others. Doc and Cassandra wielded spoons in self-defense. Murphy wasn't so lucky, being targeted by a zombie. But surprisingly, the zombie calmed down upon approaching him. Realizing the situation, Murphy quickly pushed the zombie away and ran for the stairs. Doc opened a door, calling for Addie and Mac to escape. They had just subdued a zombie using cutlery. Addie misses her wolfsbane at the moment, if she had a weapon, she wouldn't have to go through all this trouble. After everyone came in, Doc closed the door to keep the zombies out, but he was still a step too late. The zombies chased Mac and Addie all the way to the kitchen, and they almost got bitten by the zombies several times. Together, they managed to subdue and control the zombie. Mac held the zombie's head down, and Addie grabbed a blender from the cabinet, using it to end the zombie in a gruesomely effective way. Catching their breath, they pondered their next move. Meanwhile, at the main entrance, 10K was fleeing from pursuing zombies. The inhabitants of the neighborhood, who have not yet reacted, are accustomed to a life of ease and comfort, and are now powerless to resist. On the other hand, Roberta and Garnett were having a good time in the bedroom, when suddenly there was a commotion outside, and Garnett yelled at them, but the noise outside got louder. They realized that something was wrong, according to their experience of post-apocalyptic survival, it was probably zombies, but it doesn't make sense at all. Although they were puzzled, they quickly put on their clothes and trousers. Despite their confusion, they dressed and prepared to investigate, with Roberta grabbing a table lamp as a weapon. Garnett cautiously moved the chair blocking the door. Suddenly, a zombie burst in, overpowering Garnett momentarily. The lamp in Roberta's hand doesn't kill, but attracts the zombie's attention. Garnett jumped up and pressed the zombie's head against the wall once, twice. 
three times, and the zombie's skull was crushed apart. Then they went out into the corridor to check. There were no weapons available, so they had to use books to defend themselves. Approaching the stairs, a zombie charged at them, but their coordinated effort quickly subdued it. Garnett lamented the difficulty of fighting even one zombie, realizing the dire situation if the entire community turned. Then, Williams appeared, devastated, blaming Jacob's twisted plot for the chaos. Garnett reassures his old friend that he should not lose heart and that the most important thing now is to get out of here. At this time Mac and the others arrived here to meet up. They looked at each other and now Murphy and 10K were nowhere to be seen. They didn't know if they were dead or alive. Williams, pondering, suggested an escape route through the safety passage, leading to a door at the end of the hallway, and out to the woods towards their vehicle. He urged them to leave quickly. Williams, now devastated, decided to stay here and save as many people as he could. Garrick yells at everyone to get out. The sooner they leave the safer they will be. Murphy, on his own, escaped and stumbled into the bathroom, where he wanted to hide for a while. Madeline also froze in front of this man in front of her if you do not speak really like a zombies. A zombie rushed in and pounced on Madeline. Madeline, being agile, dodges the attack and uses a piece of wood she had in her hand to smash the zombie to death. Breathing heavily, Madeline looks at Murphy and questions why he didn't help. Madeline was powerless to fight, only leaving a miserable sound echoing in the bathroom, powerless to defend herself. Madeline can only let out a scream as the bathroom echoes with despair. The virus inside Murphy was gradually transforming his body, making the zombies perceive him as one of their own, perhaps even of a higher rank. Meanwhile, the instigator, Jacob, had already reached the entrance. His followers, armed with guns and weapons, were ready to take over the place and punish those who had blasphemed against the gods. Garnett and others, following William's instructions, were fleeing through the corridor to its end, but the door at the end was locked a dead end. At this worst possible moment, several other survivors followed them. Mac shouted loudly, urging them to turn back and not crowd into the space. But these people had lost their reason and surged forward en masse. In reality, the door was blocked from the inside by Mary with a chair, making it impossible to open from the outside. Cassandra yelled desperately for everyone to retreat. The zombies were charging at them, and everyone there could only await their fate. Slowly, those on the outside were devoured by the zombies. Mac tried to unite everyone to push the zombies out, but the panic-stricken crowd kept pressing inward, creating a deadly cycle. Garnett and the others, powerless to help, could only watch as the zombies devoured everyone, knowing they would be next, using all their strength to push the door. It suddenly opened with a flash of white light. It turns out that 10K was passing by and heard the voices of their old friends and saved them by coincidence. Regrettably, those inside had all turned into zombies. Garnett decided to first get weapons and then look for Murphy, as Murphy's safety was crucial. But just around the corner, they were confronted by Jacob's followers with guns. 10K and Cassandra, in a favorable position, quickly darted towards the back of the house to escape. In the previous episode, Jacob had taken complete control of the community and locked the zombies in cages. The X-Team knelt in front of Jacob. He passionately declared, You need not fear death. It is God's opportunity for your rebirth. Now, join us or become reborn like Williams, Garnett. Looking at Williams, felt a deep sense of injustice, gritting his teeth. He said, Join you and scum like you? Williams, who you killed, once sheltered you and gave you a peaceful life. This place was good and safe. Is this how you repay him? Meanwhile, in a nearby house, 10K and Cassandra had dealt with their pursuer and acquired a rifle. They quietly moved to a window, which offered a clear view of Garnett and the others. Garnett firmly refused to join. Angered, Jacob decided to turn Garnett into a zombie. 10K was anxious, but his line of sight was blocked and he couldn't take a clear shot. He needed to get to the roof for a chance. He asked Cassandra to bring the car around, but Garnett couldn't wait any longer. Jacob put a knife to Garnett's throat, ready to slash. Everyone turned at the sound coming from the cage. The zombies move out of the way and out walks a man covered in black. It was none other than Murphy. He said out loud to the believers, If you think the born again are closer to heaven then welcome your new god. He opened his shirt, revealing eight zombie bites. The followers looked on, thunderstruck. Jacob panicked. He felt his position threatened. Murphy walked out of the cell. And strangely, the zombies were calm and not as violent as before. Murphy continued, I am not the reborn you speak of, but your savior. At that moment, Murphy seemed to radiate an immense aura, surprising everyone with this unexpected sight of him. The followers wavered, finding Murphy more Christ-like than Jacob. The squad was stunned. Was this the same coward they knew? 
Murphy opened the cell door, and the zombies didn't attack but stood still, Murphy pulled Williams out and stuck two fingers into Williams' mouth, he wanted to prove himself divine, at that moment, Garnett almost believed he was witnessing God, the followers were dumbstruck, unsure of what to do next, 10k had stealthily reached the rooftop, Jacob, unwilling to relinquish his authority, pulled out a handgun and said, if you can withstand this, then I'll believe you're Jesus, Roberta and Garnett rushed out, this was the hope for the salvation of mankind, everyone was stunned, Jacob was about to shoot when 10k reacted quickly, shooting him in the shoulder and killing several followers, Cassandra drove up to the door to meet them, Murphy picked up a cross from the ground and began untying his friends, Roberta only had eyes for the injured Garnett, they had just confirmed their relationship, the zombies in the cage now surged out, attacking people around them, tragically, Garnett had been fatally shot and was dying, his last words were for Roberta to save Murphy, Cassandra had broken the gate, and the squad quickly regrouped at the car, Roberta, fixated on Garnett, was protected from the approaching zombies by 10k, finally, Mac forcibly dragged Roberta away, Roberta wanted to personally end Garnett's suffering, not wanting him to turn into a zombie, but there was no time, about two minutes later, Garnett opened his eyes, but his pupils had changed color, the car had driven about a kilometer when Roberta shouted to stop, wiping her tears, she approached 10k, took his rifle, and aimed it towards the community, breathing deeply, she aimed at the zombified Garnett, in a brief moment, Garnett seemed to make a contact with Roberta, but it wasn't over, Roberta re-aimed and shot Jacob in the chest, the followers ran to check on him, what awaited Jacob was his transformation into the very zombies he preached about, seemingly fitting their beliefs, being reborn as a gift from God, they thought, so it began with them, after doing this, Roberta got back in the car and they drove off, the atmosphere in the car was heavy, and no one spoke, Garnett was indeed a capable and responsible person, this incident brought a slight change in Murphy, who was usually troublesome, it was the third year and six months into the zombie virus outbreak, and Delta Squad X had traversed almost the entire United States in a bid to save humanity, however, 2,000 kilometers from their destination, their leader Garnett was sacrificed, casting a heavy pall over the mood in the vehicle, devoid of the usual laughter and chatter, compounding their troubles, the vehicle's engine began emitting white smoke, a problem that had already occurred five times that week, likely due to a radiator issue, they had no choice but to stop and wait for the engine to cool down before proceeding, Roberta, normally adept at fixing cars, was lost in grief since Garnett's death, Murphy, maturing in the wake of recent events, sensed the team's disarray and the need for a new leader, he vigorously shook Roberta at the car window, urging her to wake from her slumber. It's not like they're gonna follow me, or the old man or the wonder twins out there. It's one of the few times Murphy speaks from the heart, but Roberta doesn't listen and turns her head back to silence. Murphy was helpless. Max suggested that he and Addie scout ahead in case they could find someone who could fix the car, despite Doc's insistence that it was better to stay together. Mac, determined, sped off with Addie, shortly after they left. 10k found and fixed the radiator leak, but the car needed water, they had no choice but to add the last of the fresh water they had. After all, they could only wait for death in the middle of nowhere. Fortunately, the car started successfully after the repair, and along the way, Doc, like a father, taught 10k how to drive. 10 minutes later, they arrived at a crossroads, trusting his instincts. Murphy directed them to take the right turn, his sixth sense proved accurate when they spotted a sign indicating a zombie-free area, a promising sign, further on, they saw signs for a gun exhibition and beer supply, raising hopes for a lucky day, perhaps even finding a new vehicle, unknown to them, Mac and Addie had taken the left turn at the crossroads, driving towards the horizon without concern for the distance from the main group, after several kilometers, they stopped in a deserted area, Void of both supplies and zombies, Addy, puzzled about why they stopped, questioned Mac, who then revealed his intention to leave the team, believing they might fare better alone, especially since Garnett's death had fragmented the group, his only concern was Addy, hence his proposal to flee together, Addy, not angered, patiently persuaded Mac that they were a unit meant to care for each other, she reminded him of how Garnett had unhesitatingly gone back to rescue her when she was captured by cannibals, she questioned if they should now abandon Roberta and the others, arguing that they all needed each other, Mac, though reluctant, decided to listen to his girlfriend, and they turned back, but not long into their return journey, 
Max slammed on the brakes, confronted by a horrifying scene, an unprecedented number of zombies advancing from the direction they had come. Despite three years in the apocalypse, they had never witnessed such a spectacle. On Doc's side, they continued to follow the signs and, to their surprise, they indeed found an exhibition. Moreover, there were people at the entrance responsible for security checks. Interestingly, the organizers required visitors to carry weapons for entry, as they didn't have the resources to care for the defenseless. Upon arriving, a woman seated at the entrance informed them that entry required either seven bullets or medicine. Just as Doc was pondering what to do, a man dozing nearby, who turned out to be sketchy, an old acquaintance from Blue Sky Camp and a well-known arms dealer, teased Doc about his fake medicine they didn't expect to meet here. Sketchy waived the entry fee for them and began showing Doc his company's latest weapons. Meanwhile, Roberta, desiring a drink, headed straight for the bar, with Murphy following her. Concerned, feeling a bit embarrassed, Doc asked Sketchy, given their past acquaintance, for help in acquiring a new vehicle. Sketchy, apologetically stating he was a businessman, not a philanthropist, suggested they participate in an upcoming zombie shooting contest. The prize, he hinted, could be traded for a vehicle. 10k. Intrigued, asked about the prize, another man brought out a Bartley sniper rifle, a dream weapon for many, along with hundreds of bullets. Doc was indifferent, but 10k was ecstatic. Of course, he doesn't think 10k is going to win the prize, because the people who signed up for it are all tough guys. For example, that strong man over there, he was a commando sniper before the end of the world, and he was an elite sniper in the Afghan war. So he is the favorite to win the prize. 10k fell silent. At the bar Roberta was drinking at the counter and Murphy was sitting there watching over her. A few moments later Doc and the others walked in. They'd heard that a guy named One Amker here had a car. So they came to see if they could trade it for something else. Their plan fell through quickly. As Wanamaker, a heavy drinker, was unconscious and wouldn't be awake for another 48 hours. A man in a suit said flirtatiously, I have a very nice car, but what will you give me in exchange for it? he said, glancing over at Cassandra, the meaning of which was obvious. Cassandra gave him the middle finger, unperturbed. Foreman staggered out of the bar. Murphy seemed to be contemplating something and then quickly followed Foreman outside. When he came out Foreman leaned against the wall to take a leak and passed out, probably because he'd had too much to drink. Seizing the opportunity, Murphy approached Foreman and called out to him a few times, realizing Foreman was unresponsive. Murphy began searching his pockets and quickly found the car keys. Murphy was just about to leave when a pair of hands grabbed his feet. In fact, Foreman had sensed that someone was following him, so he pretended to faint on purpose. Just when Foreman was about to teach Murphy a lesson, his hands inadvertently peeled off Murphy's clothes, revealing the shocking bite marks of zombies. Terrified and sobering up rapidly, Foreman was petrified. Seeing Foreman's fear, Murphy, possibly influenced by the virus, instinctively bit Foreman's shoulder. Shocked by his own action, Murphy then picked up a rock, hit Foreman with it, and quickly fled. In the parking lot, Murphy struggled to find the right car among many. Meanwhile, Foreman, enraged, returned to the bar and showed his bite wound to the others, convincing them that a zombie had stolen his keys. Foreman incited the crowd to find and eliminate this monster for safety. And everyone, armed, stormed out of the bar. At the shooting contest, the registration was underway with a sizable queue. As soon as 10K arrived, he was attracted by the girl at the front of the line and felt the urge to get to know her. If he did not have to fill out the information, he would have followed him. As the contest was about to begin, all participants gathered. 10K tried to strike up a conversation but was rebuffed. All the contestants are actively preparing for the race. The prize for the first place is too attractive. The competition was intense with a driver leading several zombies forward. The referee randomly designated targets and any participant who missed was immediately eliminated. In the first round, a man on the edge was out. The second round followed. Meanwhile, in the Arctic, Citizen Z detected an anomaly. The satellite showed a white fog spreading in the direction of the squad. He originally thought it was just some kind of natural weather, but when he zoomed in he saw that it was actually smoke from the countless zombies advancing, realizing the gravity. He grabbed a microphone and began broadcasting a warning to survivors nearby to flee immediately. In reality, the zombie horde was not far from the exhibition, but everyone was so engrossed in the shooting contest that they were oblivious to the approaching danger. Countless zombies came from afar, creating a huge cloud of smoke. Meanwhile, the townspeople, oblivious to the impending danger, were busily engaged in a lively shooting contest. 
Reaching a climax of excitement, in the parking lot, Murphy was sneakily trying car after car with the stolen keys, unaware of which one they belonged to. Soon, a group of people surrounded him. Doc, witnessing this from afar, noticed Murphy was in trouble, a key figure in saving humanity. The instigator was Foreman, who had accused Murphy of being a zombie. Murphy attempted to defend himself, but a search revealed the zombie bite scars under his shirt. Just as Murphy resigned himself to his fate, Cassandra and Doc arrived in time. A mix-up led to the shooting of an old man in a toilet. The shot took out the seated competitor in the shooting competition. The scene became chaotic. Even Foreman got accidentally killed, and both parties were momentarily stunned. At that moment, the old man, now a zombie, burst out of the toilet. Doc took this opportunity to escape with Murphy and instructed him to stay in the car while he went to alert the others to gather and leave. In the bar, a deceased waiter, turned zombie, eyed Roberta. Roberta was still calmly drinking her beer. When the zombies jumped at her she drew her dagger and stabbed them in the palm of her hand, then used the knife at her waist to cut off their other arm. After doing so she continued to pick up her glass and said, the fact that you turned into a zombie under these circumstances means that you're just as full of lies as the rest of them, and it's all my fault. She appeared to be talking to the zombies but was actually speaking to the dead Garnett. She's been so overwhelmed with grief that she's now saying everything that's been on her mind. She misses Garnett but hates him at the same time. She hated him for saying they would go on together. Garnett had given her so many promises and hopes and she had only just started to feel that her life wasn't so bad and then she was separated from him again. As she spoke, she put on her gloves and got ready to let all that negativity out. <laughs> On the other side, the shooting match is still going on. The special forces soldier, killed by mistake, had also turned into a zombie but was quickly shot down by the contestants. The audience cheered, seemingly indifferent to the chaos around them, focused solely on the entertainment. Only five contestants remained, with the target now being a cowboy hat wearing zombie. Two missed and were eliminated, leaving three for the semifinals. Cassandra. Concerned for 10K's safety, tried to persuade him to leave. However, 10K was still in the contest, so they decided to wait and see if he could win. The situation, however, was deteriorating as more people were attacked by zombies, and a larger horde was closing in on the town. But those who are competing don't even notice. This round, the target was placed 500 yards away and was extremely difficult to hit. Eliminating the man in the middle, the 10K shot puts Brittany under a lot of pressure, and her father rushes to remind her to stay focused and not get distracted. The referee finally noticed zombies approaching from behind and called everyone to clear them out so the contest could continue. Brittany's father reassured her and led a group to fight off the zombies. They are puzzled by the sudden appearance of zombies. At the final stage of the competition, the target was a zombie in a judge's robe. 10K effortlessly shot the zombie in the head. Brittany, not to be outdone, fired at the falling zombie. Her bullet miraculously following through the same bullet hole, a truly extraordinary shot. This resulted in a tie, leading to a tense tiebreaker round. Doc was anxious to finish and leave, but Sketchy opened a betting pool, attracting a crowd. The referee, noticing something in the distance, used binoculars and saw countless zombies, including two evolved ones, heading towards the town. Sketchy quickly adapted the contest, making the two evolved zombies the new targets with the rule that missing would lead to elimination. Unfortunately, it was a tie again. Meanwhile, the car used to lure zombies ran into trouble. The driver realized that there were many zombies coming from the side. He took out his long knife and was ready to kill them, but in the end he couldn't escape from the zombies. The whole scene is very bloody. Give the man mercy! 10K was the first to shoot the driver, winning the contest. Doc congratulates 10K and encourages Brittany to try harder next time. Despite the zombie attack, Sketchy formally presented the Bartley sniper rifle to 10K. After the ceremony, they quickly packed up. Seemingly experienced in handling such chaotic situations, Sketchy even kills a couple of zombies and drives off in style. 10K and Brittany reached a chaotic parking lot swarming with zombies. At this moment, Brittany hears her father's call for help. She picks up the sniper rifle and takes aim, but there are no bullets in the rifle at this critical moment. In this critical moment, 10K shot the attacking zombie 
10K chased after them and gave Britney the prize she had so easily won. 10K was so excited that this was his first close encounter with a girl that he froze in place for a few seconds before regaining his senses. Now the priority was to find his mates and get out of here. Roberta, having vented her emotions, emerged from the bar with renewed determination to complete Garnett's unfinished mission to safely deliver Murphy to California. Doc and Cassandra had come over to take Roberta away, but after seeing this it seemed unnecessary. Three minutes later, they regrouped at the car, missing only 10k. As they worried, 10k arrived but was attacked by a nearby zombie, due to the close proximity. It was difficult for 10k to fight back with his weapon. At that critical moment, a gunshot rang out and the zombie's head cracked open. It was Brittany who took the shot. Using the same Barrett that 10k had given her, they smile at each other. Doc quickly pulled 10k away. Both groups left in their vehicles, uncertain if they would meet again. Thus, the X squad continued their journey with Roberta as their new leader. The whereabouts of Mac and Addie remained unknown, possibly waiting ahead or having left for good. Cassandra weakly eyed a cola can by the roadside, crawling towards it and attempting to drink, only to realize it was a hallucination. The X squad, on their official journey to California, had been without food for three days and nights. Doc tried to sustain himself with urine, but even that had become a luxury. The other members were equally weakened and lacked strength. Except for Murphy, who seemed lively, perhaps due to the zombie virus. He urged Roberta to actively seek food instead of waiting to die. Suddenly, they heard a rumbling sound and felt the ground tremble, fearing an earthquake. But as they looked into the distance, they gasped at the sight of a massive horde of zombies approaching, stirring up a storm of dust that seemed to engulf the world. Murphy ran but returned upon realizing his companions hadn't moved. His changed demeanor was notable. As he used to be selfish and uncaring, encouraged by Murphy, the group struggled to their feet. The zombie horde, including some fast-evolving zombies, was now less than a hundred meters away. Unable to outrun them, they took refuge in a nearby private hospital. As Roberta was closing the door, two strangers being chased by zombies appeared. One of them was caught and killed. This is the first time in three years that so many zombies have gathered. There must be a reason, but they've been starving for three days so they don't have the heart to think about it. The man who survived explained that the massive horde was due to over a million refugees in a camp in California turning into zombies due to food shortages, and the horde was migrating south for the winter. The group was shocked. Roberta immediately asked if they could bypass the horde to reach California. Otis laughed and shook his head, saying there was no way. He explained that the size of the zombie horde was beyond imagination, and a part of them had evolved to be incredibly fast. Being discovered by them meant almost certain death. After saying this, Otis took a drink from his water bottle in his backpack. Everyone's gaze shifted to the bottle, their thirst evident. Doc took the bottle to drink, but before he could take more than a couple of sips, a loud noise came from the door. Realizing the zombies were about to break in, they knew they had to leave quickly. Their only option was to move further inside the hospital, hoping to find another exit. However, when they reached the end of the corridor, they found only the morgue, with no other way out. The zombies, drawn by the scent of the living, became increasingly aggressive, and it wasn't long before they began to break through the wooden door. Otis heard the sound and reached out to look down the corridor, which scared him so much that he retracted his head and quickly closed the door. The zombies seemed to sense their presence and gathered outside, banging on the door, which creaked as if it might collapse at any moment. Although there was a window in the room leading outside, the street was filled with an even larger horde of zombies migrating south, leaving them no escape route. Weakened by three days without food, they all sat on the ground, resigned to waiting for the zombies to disperse. Murphy urged them not to give up. During his plea, 10K heard a sound coming from behind them, from inside one of the morgue drawers, wondering if there might be a zombie inside. Doc signaled 10K to get ready. He opened the first drawer, finding nothing. Then he opened the second one, and sure enough, there were zombies. Seeing that the bombies are about to bite Doc Roberta calmly took out her pistol to kill them. In order not to affect the mood, they stuffed the body back. The door to the room began to shake more violently, indicating it wouldn't hold much longer. Their plan to wait for the zombies to disperse had failed. Roberta then suggested they hide inside the morgue drawers. Despite some initial reluctance, they realized it was their only option to avoid being eaten by zombies. Fortunately, most of the drawers were empty sparing them the trouble and easing their minds a bit. After three minutes, Roberta had helped everyone into the drawers, 
leaving only Otis, claustrophobic. Otis was reluctant, but eventually complied under Roberta's insistence. Roberta took out her pistol and prepared to open the last cabinet, which was reserved for her. Unfortunately, there was a hideous body inside and she didn't know what to do. Murphy seemed to see something and went straight to the autopsy bed and pulled out a black bag from underneath. It was designed for transporting corpses, so it was pretty self-explanatory. Resigned. Roberta sighed and accepted that this was the only option left. Three minutes later, Murphy zips the bag shut. The door was on the verge of breaking. In the corridors of the hospital, a large number of zombies have gathered and the door is about to be broken open by them. In order to save Roberta's life, Murphy had no choice but to put her into a body bag, hoping to escape the impending danger. Just as he had pulled the bag close, the zombies rushed in and flooded the room. Roberta quickly closed her eyes, praying for safety. Luckily, the zombie horde wandered aimlessly through the room without noticing them. Murphy looked up with a deep look in his eyes. He was now certain that the zombies wouldn't attack him. They even seemed to fear him to some extent. Coldly surveying the room, Murphy's gaze fell on the cabinets where his companions were hiding. A sinister thought crossed his mind, opening the cabinets to eliminate these people and secure his freedom. Fortunately, he couldn't bring himself to do it and simply left the room. Murphy stepped onto the street surrounded by zombies who willingly cleared a path for him. This realization gave him a preliminary understanding of his newfound abilities. Looking around, he felt a surge of confidence. In this apocalyptic world, he believed he could outlive anyone. Suddenly, he noticed two zombies staring at him. At that moment, he felt a glare in his eyes and looked up to see a hole in a window on the floor above. With a shadow moving inside, he circled around to the front door, intending to investigate. Downstairs, a zombie in red clothing, surprisingly acting human, blocked his path. Moving quietly upstairs, Murphy approached the room and discovered only a woman and a child inside. The mother and daughter were tense, fearing that a stranger might have malicious intentions. However, Murphy was interested in the food and water on the table. Taking everything for himself, he hadn't spoken a word since entering. After taking what he needed, he prepared to leave. However, the woman quickly spoke up. You can take the things, but please leave some water for my daughter, and if you happen to see the man in the red jacket outside, at least tell him we're waiting for him to come back. But before the woman could finish her sentence, Murphy just walked away. Life is hard, indeed. The zombie in the red clothing downstairs was the woman's husband, the man. Even after turning into a zombie, instinctively guarded the entrance, which explained why he had stopped Murphy earlier. Now, as Murphy left, he understood. Initially intending to close the door, he thought twice and decided to open it, guiding the zombies inside. In that moment, human nature was on display. Nobody knew Murphy's thoughts. No one knows what Murphy was thinking. It's possible that he thought it would be difficult for the mother and daughter to survive and it would be better for them to be reunited. Alternatively, it could be the unease of conscience, fearing the discovery of his act of looting. Meanwhile, in the morgue, the zombie horde continued to linger. Roberta, in close proximity to the zombies, felt extreme nervousness. Cassandra in the cabinet shared the panic, fearing the door might accidentally be bumped and not wanting to die alone. Contrastingly, 10K slept soundly, his snores audible. Otis was in a bad way. He had a phobia of confinement and was losing control of his emotions as he listened to the zombies hissing outside. Doc tried to comfort Otis, advising deep breaths to maintain composure, but Otis, even preferring to face zombies in combat, didn't want to stay in such a confined space. The results were predictable. With screams echoing throughout the room, an hour later, the zombies had migrated, leaving only scattered remnants on the street. Murphy, carrying a backpack, moved through the area, conflicted about whether to return and reunite with the team. All along, he had sensed that these people didn't truly respect him, not even considering him a friend but more like transporting goods. However, at the doorstep, he hesitated, recalling Garnett's sacrifice and realizing he couldn't bring himself to abandon the group. Inside the morgue, only one zombie wandered. Roberta had an intuition that the zombie had sensed her presence. Fortunately, Murphy arrived in time, mentally commanding the zombie to leave. And surprisingly, it worked. Murphy unzipped the bag, revealing Roberta's face. In that moment, Murphy finally felt a sense of belonging. They then gathered around the dissecting table and ate the food Murphy had brought. Praises and compliments filled the air, everyone acknowledging Murphy's achievements. Even the usually reserved 10K gave a thumbs up. For Murphy, hearing the praises, his heart blossomed with joy. In the journey with the group so far, 
he had finally earned recognition, he's no longer just a piece of cargo, but a true friend. At that moment, Murphy looked up at the window, recalling the smiles of the mother and daughter, but his expression gradually shifted, he urged them to leave quickly, sensing Murphy's changing emotions, Roberta guessed that the origin of the food might not be as simple as he had claimed, however, in the apocalypse, everyone had done things they never wanted to do, it's been three years and seven months since the outbreak of the apocalypse, and the X-Team is still a long way from California, their vehicle had broken down, forcing them to walk for dozens of kilometers, now, all they wanted was to find a place to rest, however, they seem to have lost their way, Roberta, consulting the map, was puzzled as there should have been a small town around, but all they could see was an endless forest, at this moment, 10k reminded them to look ahead, not far away, there seemed to be a factory gate wide open, exhausted, they decided to go inside to find a safe place to rest, inside the factory, there were no zombies in sight, but they noticed that the doors were all locked, Doc, however, easily picked the locks with his universal key, once inside, armed and cautious, they discovered that the place used to be a factory with relatively new machinery, Murphy even found a jug of drinking water, a small piece of good news, but before they could relax, a zombie appeared in the distance, Roberta quickly instructed them to hide behind the door and keep quiet, strangely enough, the zombies were glowing green, which was a bit weird, Murphy's awkward noise drew the zombies' attention, and it started approaching them, the others couldn't stand it any longer, Doc, shocked at the strange zombie on the ground, exclaimed that he had never seen anything like it, the others were equally amazed, suddenly, more zombies emerged, Roberta fired a shot but ran out of bullets, at that moment, the door was kicked open, and two people in protective suits walked in, one of them shouted not to touch the zombies, and then he used his gun to eliminate the remaining three, Roberta wanted to take a closer look at the strange creatures, but the man stopped her once again, to confirm, he led them to a nearby hill and instructed them to look up. X-Team was astonished to see two giant spheres emitting yellow dust, a nuclear leak. The man, introducing himself as Wilbur, then brought them to their living quarters. Alongside him was his daughter, Amelia. In the now deserted town, only three people remained. As Wilbur continued his story, he suddenly started coughing violently, his face turning pale, following him to his home. He used instruments to check the team's radiation levels. Fortunately, their radiation levels were still within the normal range, but they might develop symptoms in the next 20 years. They weren't too concerned about this, as survival in the apocalypse was uncertain, and living for another 20 years would be a luxury. Wilbur delivered more grim news to them, the reactor core was on the verge of melting down, and if it wasn't shut down, everything within a 300-mile radius would emit a green glow, making survival nearly impossible for anyone. Murphy, alarmed immediately inquired about the availability of vehicles for their escape. However, Wilbur revealed another tragic reality. Usable vehicles in town had been taken, and the remaining ones were almost all scrapped. Additionally, the reactor was set to explode in less than 48 hours, making it impossible to walk out in time. Wilbur, though, chose to stay behind as there was a slim hope, attempting to shut down the reactor to spare the land from radiation for the next 10,000 years. Murphy was initially elated at the prospect of leaving by plane, but Wilbur delivered another blow, saying, do you think this plane can carry many people? It can only take one at most. Roberta realizes the gravity of the situation and stresses the importance of Murphy. He is humanity's last hope and nothing can go wrong. Before Roberta could finish, Wilbur burst into laughter, considering it the funniest joke he had heard. It wasn't until Murphy exposed his wounds that their expressions changed. Unwilling to wait for doom, Roberta decided they would join Wilbur in shutting down the reactor. Quickly, Wilbur led them to the factory exterior, outlining his new plan along the way. Once the iron gate was opened, X-Team's mission was clear, kill zombies to cover Wilbur's entry into the laboratory. However, they were strictly warned not to touch the bodies, displaying leadership. Roberta directed 10K to cover from a high vantage point, while Murphy and Amelia waited outside the door. If anything happens to them, Amelia will fly Murphy to California. The action commenced as Doc pushed open the gate, and they charged inside. 
their formidable combat skills made zombie killing seem effortless, all while strictly adhering to Wilbur's caution about avoiding physical contact. After 30 seconds they cleared the zombies outside, and then they entered the factory, without protective suits. They couldn't spend more than two minutes in this area due to radiation risk, so time is of the essence, the zombies inside are coming out at the sound of the noise, but luckily there aren't too many of them, Roberta seemed to unveil new combat techniques, when they got to the lift Wilbur told them to get out, they'd only be exposed to radiation if they stayed here, he'd do the rest, they wasted no time, swiftly exiting the factory, 10k breathed a sigh of relief at the sight of his companions, he didn't want to lose them, half an hour later, Wilbur stumbled out, barely holding on, resembling a flickering candle in the wind. Wilbur hung on to his last breath to tell them that he hadn't succeeded, and then he closed his eyes. When he reopened them, Wilbur had turned into a zombie. Roberta sent Wilbur on his last journey with a heavy heart. The situation had taken a turn for the worse. Without transportation, escaping the radiation zone within 48 hours was impossible. Roberta believed that the only solution was for them to go in and shut down the reactor themselves. The problem was, they had no idea how to do it. While they initially thought Amelia, being Wilbur's daughter, might know. She confessed to being a pilot and not having a clue. However, Amelia did know someone who could help, the former chief engineer of the nuclear power plant, Homer. When the apocalypse arrived, Homer retreated into the woods, living a secluded life and being highly reclusive. With no other options, they decided to attempt to contact Homer, approaching his residence. They encountered various traps. Amelia mentioned that there were landmines buried underground, but thankfully, these were set up to deter zombies and weren't particularly well hidden. 10k was a military buff these were no problem for him so they went ahead and scouted out the road and then tumbled in behind the house. One minute later, Doc and the rest confirmed it was safe, and they began their cautious approach to the front door, ready to ambush whoever might be inside, but they didn't expect. Before he could count to three, 10k's knife was at his neck, and Roberta and Amelia were also around him. Homer thought they were here to rob him, so he let them do it. After they explained their intentions, Homer no longer harbored any hostility. Instead, he invited them into his home and even offered some food to welcome them. When it came to the matter of the nuclear power plant, Homer not only didn't hesitate but also distributed some of his cherished weapons to them. Murphy strolled leisurely, seemingly unconcerned, and discovered Homer had hidden a stash of alcohol, which excited him greatly. However, Murphy's excitement was abruptly interrupted by the serious demeanor of Roberta. In fact, they all have the wrong idea about Homer, that he's difficult to work with and unwilling to help. In fact, Homer had come to the woods because he had no faith in life after the death of his son. He was now looking at the young 10K and it reminded Homer of his son. He was the same age and if he had lived he would have been this tall. After some preparation, they were ready to embark on another mission to the nuclear power plant. Their survival would hinge on this attempt. Homer informed them that this time they would be entering the highly radioactive core area. And there were only two sets of protective suits. One person had to collaborate with him. As soon as it was said, 10K walked out seeing his father's shadow in Homer. And so, 10K and Homer, clad in protective suits, charged into the nuclear power plant. They rushed towards the direction of the control room, with a precise marksmanship. 10K took down zombies with almost a single shot each. Three minutes later, they found the control console. It was only then that Homer discovered the problem. No wonder Wilbur had failed. One of the reaction pools was still running, but the electronic switch showed it was off. There must be something jammed that needed to be cleared for restoration. However, doing it manually would be very dangerous. Fortunately, Homer remembered there was a robot here, which he could control remotely. The robot had a laser that could penetrate anything. As it manipulated switches, the small robot set off, encountering zombies blocking the way. The robot unleashed its laser, cutting them open with brutal efficiency. But the good times didn't last long. Two zombies seemed to realize the threat and, surprisingly human-like, picked up the robot, intending to tear it apart. Homer considered releasing the laser again, but to his dismay, the screen went black. The little robot was killed and they had no choice but to return. They informed Team X about the situation. Now, the only solution was to manually shut down the reactor. However, the radiation there was beyond imagination, requiring high-intensity protective suits. There were two sets of this equipment in the passage where the robot was lost, so four people could go in, for safety's sake. Roberta wants Amelia to fly the plane and take Murphy away. At this moment, Amelia finally spoke the truth. It turned out the plane had run out of fuel long ago, and all along, 
She had been claiming she could escape just to stay and accompany her father, Roberta. Having once modified a car to burn alcohol, believed the plane engine could be adapted similarly, with ample alcohol on hand. They had to try, ready to act. Roberta assigned tasks. Others would assist Homer in shutting down the reactor, while she, Murphy, and Amelia would modify the engine. The four-person team quickly reached the passage and donned protective suits. They push on, with less than 30 minutes to go before the reactor explodes. They have to hurry, as they moved forward. Roberta, having gathered several boxes of white liquor, led Murphy to Wilbur's warehouse. She hoped the airplane engine and car engine were not too different. Fortunately, the basic principles were similar, and in about 10 minutes, Roberta completed the modification. Amelia took the rest of the booze with her and hoped it would be enough to get 300 miles away. Roberta knew that Team X was facing a life-threatening situation this time, and as she and Murphy parted ways, there was a hint of choking in her voice. Murphy, too, put away his usual playful demeanor. Roberta's words made him realize that this separation might be the last time they see each other. Shortly after, the plane successfully started and slowly moved towards the distance, with tears in her eyes. Roberta hoped that Murphy, carrying the hopes of everyone, would successfully reach California to save humanity. Just five minutes into the flight, Murphy kept talking incessantly. Suddenly, the plane started shaking violently. Amelia reassured Murphy not to panic, attributing it to encountering strong air currents. But before she could finish her sentence, the shaking intensified, and the plane headed straight for the grassland. I don't know how long it took for Murphy to get out of the cockpit. He couldn't believe he was still alive. He hurriedly went around to the other side to check on Amelia. When he opened the door he froze. Amelia's chest had been pierced by rebar and she had been turned into zombies. Murphy felt a pang of sadness. He had intended to give this girl a merciful end, following Roberta's example with Garnett. But looking at her face, he couldn't bring himself to do it. Turning around, Murphy ran outside and found a rock on the ground, ready to take care of it remotely. However, he froze again. Amelia behind him didn't go berserk. Instead, she mimicked his movements, clumsily touching her own forehead. Murphy couldn't bring himself to harm her. He simply took his backpack and left, with Amelia following behind. On the other side, 10K and the others had reached the entrance of the reactor. However, the radiation inside was too high, rendering ordinary protective suits ineffective. Homer insisted that they leave, leaving the rest of the task to him alone. But 10K refused to back down and insisted on helping. Homer chuckled and accepted. Knowing that with reinforced protective suits, they should be fine. Upon opening the door and entering, they were immediately confronted by a few zombies. 10K makes quick work of them, but one zombie lunges at Homer. It was only then that they noticed a large hole bitten into Homer's protective suit. Homer instantly felt despair. Even if he shut down the reactor, he wouldn't survive for long. However, he faced his imminent fate with acceptance. Since stepping through the gate, he had been prepared for sacrifice. Being able to spend a few hours with 10K was the happiest time in Homer's recent years. Much like having a son still by his side. After a few moments of emotion, they made their way to the top of the reactor, below. The blue liquid contained the most intense radiation. The failure of the two rods to descend made it impossible to shut down the reactor automatically. They had to use a harness to lower someone manually and align the rods. If someone fell into the liquid, not even bones would remain. As Homer descended slowly, he almost touched the surface. Using his hands to press the rods downward, the first one succeeded. Next was the second. Homer had closed his eyes, the radiation causing unbearable discomfort, as if he were being roasted over a fire. Now, he relied solely on willpower to endure. With a click, they succeeded the reactor was closed. Not only was Homer exposed to this intense radiation, but he touched it with his hands. And every moment he lived was an ordeal. The radiation inside the reactor was so horrible, Homer melted as soon as he fell in. 10K, both sad and angry, walked out in a fury. The others outside breathed a sigh of relief seeing 10K unharmed. 10K was furious with his own helplessness. He had once watched his father slowly turn into a zombie, and that had been the first zombie he killed. Now, witnessing someone like a father figure, Homer, die in front of him, he felt powerless. Roberta arrived in an electric car, relieved to learn of their success. The car could take them some distance. However, Doc sighed, wondering where they should go now. Murphy might already be close to California, and they had no target. As Doc finished speaking, a figure appeared walking up from below the slope. Murphy, who had traveled only 10 kilometers but said he had traveled 160 kilometers, sat in his car, 
took out a bottle of wine and drank it. When asked about Amelia, Murphy pointed into the distance, seeing the scene, it was truly heartbreaking. However, what they didn't understand was why Murphy didn't give Amelia a merciful end. This was considered the highest respect for a friend. Roberta stood up to come herself but Murphy stopped her. The others hesitated but didn't insist. They trusted Murphy's judgment. And so the group of five traveled away in this patrol car just wondering how many kilometers they could travel. In the dimly lit corridor, two figures, a man and a woman, were moving through as they walked. They heard some noises ahead and cautiously went to investigate. Not far away, there was a room with a person sitting inside, wearing a prisoner's uniform and a hood. It was likely that they had already turned into a zombie. Addie excitedly raised her spiked club, ready to give him a final send-off, only to find out it was just a lifeless body. These two individuals were none other than Mac and Addie, who had become separated from Team X. They didn't know where this place was. In the morning, when they contacted Citizen Z at the Arctic Station, he had simply instructed them to come here. Soon, they entered another room, and as soon as they opened the door, four or five zombies were attracted to the noise. Addie casually approached. She had developed some mental issues during this period and seemed a bit twisted. She now thoroughly enjoyed the process of killing. Suddenly, there was another sound in the corridor, reminiscent of zombies hitting pipes, and it was quite loud. Mac pulled out his gun and took the lead to investigate. However, strangely, as they approached, the sound disappeared. Surprisingly, the unexpected joy was the reunion with Roberta and the others, whom they had been desperately searching for. Both sides embraced each other, never expecting to see each other again, let alone in this place. After adjusting their emotions, they realized it wasn't the time for reminiscing, they were starving and needed to find the man called Chester. It was only then that Mac noticed Cassandra's injured leg. Doc explained that Cassandra had accidentally been scratched by barbed wire yesterday and had an infection, they just hoped it wasn't tetanus. Although everyone was hungry, the fact that Team X was complete again lifted their spirits. They proceeded cautiously along the corridor, following the route described by Citizen Z. Chester should be in one of these rooms. Roberta knocked on the door, but there was no response. She opened it and walked in. Chester was indeed inside, but he was already dead. A bullet hole glaring on his forehead. It was unclear what he had been through. Addie picked up her spiked club and struck it once, twice, thrice. She had been acting strangely lately, frequently envisioning scenes of her family turning into zombies. After releasing her pent-up emotions, Addie finally noticed everyone looking at her with strange expressions. They were all speculating whether Addie had been through some traumatic experience during the time they were separated. At this moment, a familiar voice came from behind them, continuously calling for Chester. As they walked into the room, Citizen Z, who had been calling for Chester, was taken aback. Is this woman leading the group Roberta? He wondered. Soon after, Citizen Z saw Addie, whom he had longed to see and quickly greeted her. In Mac's mind, he cursed silently. After exchanging a few sarcastic remarks, Citizen Z remembered the main purpose of the communication, he solemnly said, I have good news here, the California Laboratory is back online and has contacted me. Your efforts for this country will not be in vain. I sincerely thank you, however, the news didn't move them, what they urgently needed now was not praise but information on where to find food. Citizen Z smiled awkwardly and then used the satellite to quickly find the room where the food was stored. After obtaining food and gasoline, Team X continued their journey along the road. The existence of the California Laboratory further strengthened their belief in saving the world. However, escorting Murphy was undeniably a painful task because of his lack of manners. Murphy was currently enjoying a can of sardines without a care for his companions in the car. As they continued down the road, they saw a severed zombie torso, obviously that of a child. It was truly heart-wrenching. After a while, they had already left Salt Lake City 250 miles behind. At this moment, 10K tapped the roof of the car to alert everyone to a situation ahead. They all looked, and once again, they saw a child turned into a zombie, carrying a backpack, walking towards them. Addie asked Roberta to pull over, she wanted to give this child a merciful end. However, as she raised her spiked club to strike, memories of her younger brother turning into a zombie flooded her mind. Addie stood frozen in place. Roberta couldn't bear to see Addie like this and tried to comfort her. She wasn't angry. After all, Addie was her friend. They continued driving, but after a few dozen miles, another child appeared in front of them. This time, however, it was not a zombie but a living person. This road was getting weirder and weirder. Roberta got out and, after ensuring there were no ambushes around, put away her weapon. Uh. 
a little thirsty is all. Regardless of the situation, basic kindness should prevail when dealing with children. After finishing the water, Sam politely thanked Roberta. He mentioned that he had grown up and wanted to go to Salt Lake City to see his father, and his mother had encouraged him to venture out. Roberta was surprised, unsure of how long Sam had been on the road. However, the idea of traveling 300 miles to Salt Lake City, now occupied by zombies, seemed implausible. The situation struck her as strange, but Roberta didn't think much of it. She just assumed that Sam's father was dead and his mother had made up a lie that his father was in Salt Lake City. Recalling the two children who had turned into zombies earlier, she felt compelled to intervene. Otherwise, the boy might not survive three days. Roberta kindly lied, telling Sam that they would help him find his family, and they would drive him to Salt Lake City. Sam gladly agreed, finding walking difficult and he genuinely wanted to assist these kind strangers. After driving another 60 miles, Sam directed them into a valley. Outside, signs warned against approaching, but there were no guards or patrols in sight. They stopped the car, and Roberta instructed Mac to scout the area. As Mac approached the gate, armed individuals suddenly appeared on both sides of the valley. Strangely, they were all women. Mac puts his gun away and tries to make it clear that he doesn't mean any harm, but the men don't take it that way and just shoot and threaten. Roberta raised her hands and walked out, loudly explaining, We came here with no ill intentions, we just want to return the lost child to you. After Roberta spoke, the women's expressions softened slightly, the iron gate creaked open, and four women emerged, with Helen, the leader, Looking stern, Sam quickly explained that these were good people just looking for some food. Initially, Roberta thought that these people would be happy and grateful as they had returned the child. However, despite Helen expressing thanks verbally, her demeanor always seemed somewhat aloof. It wasn't until she noticed Cassandra's injured leg that her demeanor changed. Helen assertively declared that she would help treat Cassandra, but only women and children were allowed inside. The men had to stay outside. This peculiar rule left them all in a state of confusion. Nevertheless, Roberta nodded in agreement. As Cassandra's leg injury couldn't be delayed any longer, once healed, they would leave. Thus, the men had no choice but to wait outside. However, a fortunate event occurred one of the women took an interest in one of them. Five minutes later, they were led into the community, and the sight inside astonished them. For years after the end of the world, there was still a place like this. Before they even got out of the car, a resident offered to take Cassandra to get her wounds treated. The environment here not only appeared beautiful but also showcased a remarkable harmony in interpersonal relationships. Wanna see my carrots? While Addie marveled at the scene, Roberta couldn't help but smile. After traversing the entire United States, exhausted and worn, arriving here brought an immediate sense of relaxation to their bodies and minds. Helen warmly guided Roberta around the community, familiarizing her with the structures. She even showcased the cultivation of vegetables, fruits, livestock, and poultry, indicating that the community was entirely self-sufficient. There's a lot of milk, butter, and other ingredients that you can't find anywhere else. Moreover, they had a pharmacist who could produce medicines like penicillin and antibiotics. Roberta found it all incredibly unbelievable. Helen even arranged a hot bath for her. Meanwhile, Addie was engrossed in playing with a little girl. In recent times, Addie had been mentally unstable, weary of zombies and the post-apocalyptic world. However, upon arriving here, she completely relaxed. Everything seemed so beautiful without zombies and conflicts. At first, Roberta shared this sentiment, but she soon sensed something amiss there were only women and children here, not a single man. Helen didn't reveal much, only mentioning that these women were unfortunate souls who found happiness here. Despite Helen's reassurances, the more she spoke, the more suspicious Roberta became. Finding an excuse, she left the dining table, claiming to check on Cassandra. In the medical room, she discovered that Cassandra's wound had been properly treated. Seeing the doctor leaving, Cassandra immediately displayed a grave expression, realizing that something was off. Roberta seemed to understand what was happening. It was horrifying. No wonder they had witnessed several boys turning into zombies on their way here. It turned out that this place was an all-female community. Boys, upon reaching the age of 13, were encouraged to journey to Salt Lake City to find their fathers. Most of them would die on the way, and the mothers here seemed to be indoctrinated into accepting this practice. Roberta was shocked to find that. Despite the apparent happiness in the community, 
Something was disturbingly abnormal. She decided that when Cassandra showed some signs of improvement, they would leave, but what they never realized was that Helen, in the guise of a big sister, had approached Addie to listen to her past. Addie had memories she preferred not to recall, such as witnessing her family turn into zombies and the experiences with cannibals. It was all a shadow she couldn't shake. Helen took the opportunity to immediately put some of her thoughts into Addie's head, as if she was feeling the same way. Helen even says that the source of violence is men. She then invited Addie to stay, emphasizing that without men, nothing bad would happen. Addie, who had been depressed recently, found a sense of identity and belonging when she heard Helen's words. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> I have to say Helen is definitely an expert in psychology. Meanwhile, outside, Doc and the others were setting up camp. At this time, a woman dressed in cool clothes came out with two portions of food in her hand. Doc was instantly captivated. Serena's arrival wasn't merely about delivering food. She was in search of someone. Eagerly, Serena walked over, a smile forming on 10K's lips. But Serena didn't even glance at him. Murphy understood without a word. And so, they both entered the small tent, indulging in blueberry pie. Serena seems to know how to flirt as she tries to unbutton Murphy's shirt. But Murphy grabs her hand. His body bore the marks of zombie bites, and he didn't want Serena to see. Undeterred, Serena continued to undress Murphy, still enjoying the moment. Sure enough, when Serena saw the bite marks, she was startled. Unexpectedly, instead of fear, she became incredibly excited. Let's skip the rest of the plot. In the neighborhood, Helen and Addie talk more and more, and at one point they hug each other and choke on their tears. Suddenly, there was the sound of a car, and it turned out that a newcomer had joined in. As it turns out, the people who went out met a couple where the wife was being severely abused by her husband, so they rescued her. Helen again showed her compassionate look. This kind of person is the best brainwashing. Subsequently, the abusive husband was brought up, and all the women were furious. Doc also touched the hill at some point and he secretly saw the scene of the execution of the man. The man gnashed his teeth, incredibly resentful, merely for abusing his wife. He found himself seized by this community consisting only of women. Meanwhile, Helen walked behind with an indifferent expression, feeling that the true purpose of establishing her charitable sisterhood was revealed here, to rescue women harmed by men. Subsequently, everyone arrived outside a small cabin. The items inside were specifically designed for punishing men. Tessa had something to fall back on and she firmly picked up the stun baton. The man walked in and looked in horror at what was inside. It was a brown bear that had turned into a zombie. It was horrible. The screams were heard all over the valley. Doc happened to witness the scene, swallowing hard. Roberta felt that the ideology here was becoming too extreme. She prepared to talk to Addie, advising her to leave, concerned that with time, they might truly be brainwashed. Just then, Helen approached, inviting Addie to go outside. She mentioned a team where the man was from, along with two unfortunate sisters, all needing rescue. Addie gladly accepted, but Roberta immediately intervened, fearing Addie would be assimilated into the community. When Roberta can't stop her, she offers to go herself, but she's doing it to look out for Addie, and outside Doc ran back shouting that they had to get out of there. The neighborhood was so hostile to men. Before Doc could reveal what he had witnessed, they heard a car starting to leave, Helen heading out for the rescue. No, Addie doesn't go anywhere without me. She just did. Half an hour later, they reached the inevitable path of those people. Addie and another attractive woman popped the hood, waiting for the fish to bite. Sure enough, before long, someone arrived. They had smiles playing on their lips, then immediately feigned the appearance of a helpless, delicate girl whose car had broken down. Unsure of what to do, there were three motorbikes, and the man at the head was the boss. His eyes glistened at the sight of a beautiful woman and he said he could help. He didn't mind them seeing the two women tied up on his motorbike. Then he signaled his men to get off and take them away by force. Little did he know, they had walked right into the trap. Hands up, gentlemen! Wait, wait, wait! Your little game is over! Whoa, 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 whoa. Immediately, Roberta and the others emerged with guns, taking positions and leaving no chance for resistance or escape. Helen didn't kill them immediately but tied them to a rope. Drop your guns. Oh, I'm not really with them. They just, I, I was stranded and they Shut helped me. Shut up. Out. You're fired. That ain't happening, sweetheart. Oh, oh, oh. Hold your fire. Hold your fire. I'm a reasonable man. You see? Hmm? I'm sure we can come to some kind of an arrangement. 
Why don't you just tell me what you want? Let me ask you. These girls with you voluntarily? Hey, hey, listen to me! Didn't think so. Ladies? The lead man continued to speak persuasively, claiming there were valuable items in his car. In his view, in the post-apocalyptic world, there were no enemies as long as there were benefits. However, he had encountered Helen, who harbored a strong hatred for men. Helen handed the gun to Addie, intending for her to administer justice. She requested Addie to shoot just one person, no headshots necessary. It was implicit killing one man and turning him into a zombie would lead to the miserable deaths of the other two. Addie raised the pistol, but Roberta quickly intervened. Addie, don't do this. You don't want to get in my way, sister. Remember the cannibal. Helen brainwashed Addie once again, reminding her of the cannibals who had kidnapped her. As she spoke, a gunshot rang out. Addie shot the man at the edge, wearing a fierce expression on her face. With that, they got on their motorbikes and went back to the community, leaving only those chained up. Suddenly, the deceased man turned into a zombie and lunged at his two companions. On the other side, Doc and the others were already packing up. Max saw the returning car from afar. However, the one Addie was on didn't stop. It headed straight for the community. Only Roberta jumped off. Her first words to the three were, we need to leave this place quickly. Doc joined in, mentioning that he also saw the zombie bear. However, Roberta told him it wasn't the main concern. The extreme ideology of the community was the real threat. She glanced at Mac as she spoke. Mac guessed that Addie might be unwilling to leave, but he firmly stated that if Addie didn't go, he wouldn't either. Roberta, feeling helpless, reminded them to prepare to leave. She would try to persuade Addie, but she also warned Mac to be mentally prepared for failure. Inside the community, Helen sat with Addie in a gazebo, wiping off the dust from her hands and consoling her to look forward. She emphasized that men could never be relied upon, recounting how she had killed her own husband and subsequently lived a free and happy life. Helen then invited Addie to stay, away from the conflicts outside. Addie, fortunately, wasn't completely brainwashed. She felt a genuine love for Mac and couldn't bear to leave him. However, Helen's brainwashing skills were formidable, and her persuasive words initially seemed reasonable. Helen said, I know you love him, dear, but Mac will die someday. Is it not painful to watch him die before your eyes? Or do you want to be the one to show him mercy? Helen led Addie into that scenario, and Addie couldn't help but shudder after a moment of horror. Ultimately, she agreed to stay. Ten minutes later, when Roberta entered and didn't find Addie, she went to the medical room to call Cassandra to search together. Unbeknownst to them, Addie had already gone outside, where Mac excitedly ran to her. They came to a quiet place. Addie didn't know how to speak at first, but described the community as a paradise. After some hesitation, she finally revealed her decision to stay. This episode closely mirrored real-life situations. Addie, seemingly ready to abandon Mac for a life of pleasure, feigned a distressed expression, saying, Mac really loves Addie and would throw his life away for her. He begs, as long as our hearts are together, nothing is difficult. You used to be so strong and kind. When Mac criticized Helen as a cult leader brainwashing her, Addie, displeased, turned away and left decisively. I have to go. Addie would. No. Mac, let me go. Addie. I'm sorry. Mac followed her to the door, but he was blocked from entering, feeling empty about abandoning her former lover. Addie returned to the neighborhood and immediately ran to her room to hide. Roberta and Cassandra saw her and tried to take Addie with them, but no matter how much they shouted, Addie never looked at them. In an absurd turn of events, facing her old comrades who had faced life and death together, Addie chose to ignore them. Strangely, Helen arrived, and Addie willingly opened the door for her. The next few minutes were filled with more brainwashing. Meanwhile, Doc's almost done packing, but there's no sign of Murphy. When he asked, he realized that the guy was still in the tent with the woman, and he couldn't believe it. When Doc opened the tent, they were leisurely watching him. Up and at him! Serena walked back to the community with a beaming smile. The hours of intimacy left her thoroughly satisfied, and she couldn't help but burst into laughter at the thought. However, suddenly, inside the community, Addie and Helen walked out, and Addie wore a smile on her face. 
Seeming remarkably serene, Addie gently expressed that she had made up her mind to stay and live with Helen, Cassandra still wanted to advise Addie, but a woman approached, reporting an issue at the main gate that required Helen's attention, seeing an opportunity, Cassandra and Roberta thought they could finally talk some sense into Addie, however, they underestimated her, no matter how hard they tried to speak, Addie's face remained lightly smiling, as if she were watching fools, this attitude was truly irritating, I'm home now. With things having reached this point, they could only stand in place and sigh. After all, they have a deep bond from being together for so long. Outside the gate, the man hadn't died. Judging from the chains on his hands, it was evident that he had likely severed his teammate's right arm to escape. Now, all he wanted was revenge against Helen. Helen was gritting her teeth she simply wouldn't compromise for a member of the team. In a crucial moment, gunshots rang out Mac took action, looking indifferently at the women. Five. Four, three, two. As the gate opened, Helen pretended to care and hugged Serena. Roberta and Cassandra were also escorted out, with Addie following behind. We don't leave each other. I will always love you, Mac. Goodbye, Mac. Roberta was furious that Mac had been shot, but given the circumstances, they had no choice but to pull Mac and leave. Addie had become so heartless that there was no point in trying to persuade her any longer. However, once on the car, Mac couldn't accept it. He didn't want to give up and shouted for Doc to stop the car, while Roberta insisted on moving forward. Unexpectedly, Mac jumped out of the moving car, a clear indication of Addie's significance in his heart. Mac climbed to his feet and stumbled back again. He was out of his mind, even pointing a gun at Roberta who tried to stop him. Helpless, Roberta could only wish him good luck. Soon, gunfire echoed in the valley, urging them to leave quickly. Panel X had no choice but to drive away. As the car slowly departed, a heavy atmosphere lingered. Addie and Mac had made their choices, but somehow, something had soured along the way. Serena, who had been involved with Murphy, stood on the hilltop watching, and the little boy they had brought back with them embarked on the road again, heading to Salt Lake City to find his dad. In the third year and seventh month of the apocalypse, Squad X is just a few hundred miles from California, but instead of feeling elated, they are somber due to Mac and Addie's departure, it seems unlikely they'll ever meet again in this lifetime. Meanwhile, Murphy is concerned about himself. Ever since being injected with the zombie virus, his body has undergone many changes. Now, not only does his face resemble a zombie's with growing hair, but his skin has also become dry and wrinkled. When he gently tears at it, the skin actually peels off. This situation causes him panic. He doesn't understand what's happening to him. After pondering, Murphy decides not to tell his companions and quietly pockets the peeled skin. As they walk, the road ahead is blocked by a stretched Lincoln lying across the path. To avoid damaging the vehicle, Roberta drives across the adjacent grassland. After a while, they recognize that this place used to be a golf course. To get back on the road, they need to cross a wooden bridge. Uncertain if it can still bear weight, they disembark to assess the situation. Fortunately, the wooden bridge is still strong and has not been damaged by age. At that moment, Roberta's walkie-talkie crackles to life with Citizen Z from the North Pole Station. Murphy, angry, snatches the walkie-talkie. He has been furious since being used as a guinea pig. Now, with his body undergoing so many changes, his pent-up emotions erupt. He wishes he could beat up the doctor who injected him with the zombie virus. As Murphy is furiously berating Citizen Z, a group of zombies approaches from a distance. They run out of bullets after just three or four shots and have to pick up golf clubs from the ground. Surprisingly, they work quite well, but the incoming number of zombies is overwhelming, and they start to encircle the group. Roberta yells for them to take shelter in the clubhouse, hoping to escape the horde. Unfortunately, as soon as they enter, more zombies follow them from another side. After locking the door, they realize Murphy isn't with them, but they're not worried. After all, zombies won't attack Murphy. Before they can catch their breath, more zombies emerge from a room in the house. The narrow space makes it difficult to swing the baseball bats. Cassandra suddenly noticed some small balls inside the basket she asked 10k to try with the slingshot. As zombies draw closer, they are forced to hide in a compartment, just when they are struggling to hold out. Gunshots ring out from outside, sounding intense. Gradually, the noise ceases, 
The zombies seem to have been eliminated. They initially think Murphy found weapons and came to rescue them, but the voices from outside are unfamiliar, they remain cautious, as sometimes humans can be more dangerous than zombies. Roberta pulls out her weapon, signaling the others to prepare for a rush outside. Seeing no hostility from the trio they encountered, they lower their weapons, turning to see. Squad X is accustomed to such sights, but the three newcomers are stunned by the scene outside. There, Murphy, in a yellow suit he found somewhere, is leisurely playing golf among the zombies. Looks like a good fight. Before the apocalypse, he was just a street thug with no chance to engage in such sports. Now, he's taking full advantage of the opportunity. After playing for a while, Murphy strolls back, whistling, in search of Roberta and the others. Introductions are made, and they get acquainted. The trio turns out to be unexpectedly hospitable, offering barbecued meat chunks from their stash. Janice is particularly concerned about Murphy, making him think he's irresistibly charming. At dinner time, everyone gathers around the table, and Zimmerman serves drinks to each. I don't know if it's just an illusion or what but they seem to be more interested in Murphy, asking him, consciously or unconsciously, how he was able to have this ability. Roberta is cautious, indirectly reminding Murphy not to share too much considering they're strangers, but Murphy ignores her warnings, boldly lifting his shirt to show his bite marks. He proudly claims that zombies consider him one of their own and that he's the only one who can save the world. They listen in disbelief, but the evidence is right in front of them. Then Zimmerman proposes to help Squad X reach California to save the world. Raising a toast in celebration, Roberta feels uneasy, her instincts telling her something is off, but she raises her glass politely. Not only that, but Doc was out on sentry duty alone and didn't get a drink, so Henry himself came out with a glass of wine for him. After a brief exchange, Doc downs his drink in one gulp. Satisfied, Henry takes back the empty glass. Ten minutes later, Squad X starts feeling dizzy and yawns incessantly, assuming it's from drinking too much. 10K quickly slumps onto the table, asleep. Murphy mocks him, suggesting it might be his first time drinking. But then Cassandra also collapses, turning Murphy's amusement into concern. Something is definitely wrong. Murphy was the only sober person at the table. Half an hour later, Roberta opens her eyes to find everyone handcuffed together, with a zombie viciously trying to pounce on them, attached to Cassandra's left hand. Lucky the zombies were handcuffed or they'd be dead already. Moreover, Murphy and the three others have disappeared. Roberta calls out twice but quickly stops. Aware that attracting zombies from outside would be digging their own grave, she urges everyone to calm down and look for something sharp to deal with the nearby zombie. Doc signals to 10k to check under him for a weapon, but all he finds is something akin to a toothpick. Then Roberta spots an umbrella on top of a cabinet, perfect as a makeshift weapon. Doc and 10k cooperate to grab the umbrella and hand it to Cassandra. Working together, they swing their bound arms to take out the zombie. They were relieved to get rid of the zombies. Otherwise it would have been creepy to have one around all the time. Now, the focus is on unlocking the handcuffs. Roberta slightly turns her body and picks up a nail from the ground with her mouth, hoping it might unlock the cuffs. Meanwhile, Zimmerman and his accomplices, who drugged them, are driving away, with Murphy kidnapped in their vehicle. Murphy, ever talkative, keeps mouthing off no matter who he's with. The trio is somewhat speechless at his non-stop chatter. Murphy sarcastically says, So, after hearing my story, you think delivering me to California could be profitable, and you could become world-saving heroes? But that seems unlikely, considering you're going the wrong way. California is in the opposite direction. Unexpectedly, Henry replies with disdain, the place we're heading to is in California, you'll find out soon enough. Before the apocalypse, they were nobodies, not living as freely as they are now, hence preferring the world not to return to normal. Murphy's face turned ugly, originally thought they were just greedy for fame and fortune, but never realized that they were outright bad guys. He starts worrying about Roberta and the others, fearing they might already be harmed. We left him for the Z's. Darwin will take care of the rest. Murphy is relieved to know his companions are capable enough to get out of trouble. Indeed, Roberta and the others have already unlocked their handcuffs. They realize that the trio must have tampered with the drinks. 10K speculates whether Murphy might have collaborated with them to escape. However, the others believe it's unlikely, as Murphy, despite his incessant talking, considers them friends and wouldn't betray them. The most plausible scenario is that Murphy was taken by them. Roberta, furious and without a word, prepares to start the vehicle to track down and teach the culprits a lesson, but when she turns the key, the vehicle doesn't respond. Unable to start the car, they are forced to return to the road. 
hoping to find a usable battery in the abandoned vehicles. However, they are clueless about where Murphy has been taken or even which direction to start searching. Cassandra, without voicing her thoughts, heads straight to the driver's seat and finds a satellite phone. Having suspected its presence due to the antenna she noticed at the rear of the vehicle, with the satellite phone, they contact Citizen Z at the North Pole Station, hoping he can help locate Murphy. Upon hearing the situation, Citizen Z's expression darkens, with the destination nearly reached. Any problem with Murphy could render everyone's efforts futile. He quickly leverages his resources, searching for the vehicle color described by Roberta via satellite. Soon, he finds a surveillance image on a road, taken two hours earlier. In the east direction from Squad X's location, Roberta is about to say more when the signal cuts off. Meanwhile, Zimmerman, with Murphy in tow, arrives at a three-way intersection. Murphy was so desperate to go to the loo, he actually wanted to leave Roberta and the others a clue. Coincidentally, he spots a camera and an LED screen ahead. Citizen Z is puzzled about how to convey this message to the squad. An hour later, Roberta and the team, traveling eastward, also reach the three-way intersection. At a loss, they're unsure which way to go. With no signal on the satellite phone, Doc even considers flipping a coin to decide. Suddenly, a line of text and an arrow appear on the display screen. They gather around, guessing it might be a message from Citizen Z. Ultimately, the squad decides to follow the direction indicated by the arrow. On the other hand, Zimmerman's vehicle has come to a halt, and they prepare to proceed on foot. Under Murphy's questioning, Zimmerman reveals the purpose of their journey. A pharmaceutical factory named Mesa, six miles from their location, has a substantial stockpile of drugs, especially OxyContin, a painkiller that's incredibly valuable in the apocalypse. Almost tradable for anything, but there are dozens of zombies in there, some of them are also high on acid and can move very fast. Thus, Murphy's unique ability is needed to safely and smoothly retrieve the drugs. They promise Murphy his freedom in exchange for retrieving the medication. They've stopped the car here to avoid attracting zombies with the noise. Murphy pretends to cooperate, seeing it as a potential escape opportunity. After Zimmerman finished talking, he went to the cockpit. He wanted to tamper with the car so that no one would pass by and mess up their plan. The mechanism will activate as soon as the car door is opened, while their attention is elsewhere. Murphy gets an idea for a bold experiment. He takes their water bottle, spits into it, and quickly puts it back as if nothing happened. Janice, as if compelled, comes over and takes a big gulp of water. Murphy just watched. After setting up the trap on the car, Zimmerman leads them on foot. Murphy's handcuffs are removed, and he starts chatting with Janice inquiring why she wears a wedding ring but her husband is nowhere to be seen. Mentioning her husband seems to hit a sore spot. Janice shares her story. A month ago, her husband was alive. Zimmerman sent him to the Mesa Pharmaceutical Factory to get drugs, but he was bitten by zombies and left behind. As they talk, Zimmerman asks them to wait while he scouts ahead. With no one watching him closely, Murphy tells Janice, you must be upset. Your husband died, and the ambitious Zimmerman is still alive. Do you think Murphy is just being rude by spitting in the water bottle? No. He's testing something. Murphy bows his head and slowly raises his right hand. Strangely, Janice's hand holding the gun also rises as if controlled. This is Murphy's new ability. Anyone who has had contact with him can be controlled by him. Janice seems to struggle momentarily, then regains consciousness. Unaware of what just happened, Murphy stands up, intensifies his mental control and Janice's hand rises again. In the previous episode, Murphy, the guy with no manners, spat into the water bottle, which the woman unknowingly drank. It was indeed a bit disgusting. However, Murphy did this to experiment with his supernatural abilities. Taking advantage of the kidnapper's distraction, Murphy extends his right hand, mimicking holding a gun, and slowly lifts it. Airily, Janice uncontrollably mimics the same motion, but she soon came to her senses. Janice didn't know what was going on and thought she was in a trance. Murphy stands up and concentrates, sending a signal for Janice to fire the gun. As the thought arises, Janice's right hand uncontrollably begins to rise. Doc and the others heard the shots. They don't know what happened, but it guides them in the direction of the rescue. Seeing his plan succeed, Murphy quickly takes Janice's handgun. But Henry, thinking Murphy is trying to escape, rushes over to wrestle for the gun. At this time, Zimmerman, who went out to scout, heard the gunshot and rushed back. He was very angry and asked what was going on. Janice, as if possessed, surprisingly defends Murphy. Zimmerman stops the argument and tells them to follow him. 
They must get the drugs from Mesa before dark. Murphy's gunshot was to signal Squad X's location, and now he deliberately leaves his jacket behind. Roberta and the others, hearing the gunshot, indeed head in that direction and soon reach Zimmerman's parked car. The road is blocked, so they're forced to stop. Upon inspecting, they find no one in the car. Roberta tries to open the door to move the car but triggers the trap. Zimmerman naturally heard it but didn't care. Whoever triggered the mechanism would attract the zombies. However, he didn't expect it to be X-Team. Although zombies swarm them, the squad, armed, handles them with little difficulty and clears them out in a few minutes. They continue along the road and soon find Murphy's jacket, confirming he was indeed kidnapped. After traveling 5 kilometers, Zimmerman stops. Just over the hill is the pharmaceutical factory. They prepare to rest and recover to ensure victory in their upcoming operation. Henry and Janice, without wasting time, sit down to drink water and replenish their strength. Murphy approaches, looking down at Henry with a condescending attitude. Initially, Henry doesn't care, but gradually, his consciousness seems to slip away, and he begins to pass the water to Murphy. At this time, Zimmerman spoke up and interrupted this weird scene. They finally crest the hill and see the so-called Mesa Pharmaceutical Factory below. Inside the fence are numerous zombies, some having ingested stimulants, moving incredibly fast and, in their frenzy, even devouring each other. Murphy is apprehensive. Regular zombies don't attack him, but these seem mutated or evolved, and he's genuinely scared. He outright refused to enter the pharmacy. Zimmerman, of course, disagrees and shoves Murphy against a tree. As Zimmerman starts to utter a threat, Murphy bites his arm, leaving a bloody tooth mark. Zimmerman, enraged, draws a handgun and aims it at Murphy's head. At that moment, Janice beside him gets excited, claiming she has seen her husband. Zimmerman tells her to shut up. Though gunpoint, Murphy appears calm, as if everything is under his control. He doesn't resist further and agrees to go in and steal the drugs. Three minutes later, they approach the main gate. Zimmerman says, we'll distract the zombies. Then it's your turn, go straight to the farthest door inside. Find the power switch and turn it on. On the second floor of the warehouse is an air raid alarm control, activated to attract the zombies, allowing a safe entry. After that, Zimmerman and Henry will go to the side of the door to attract the zombies. Murphy took this opportunity to walk behind Janice and said, with her mental state fragile, she's more susceptible to control. Holding her pistol, she's ready to take out Zimmerman. Murphy opens the gate and enters. The zombies glance at him but quickly avert their gaze. This means that no matter how much these zombies have mutated, they will treat Murphy as one of their own kind or even as a higher level being. But he didn't dare to be careless. He still slowly advanced step by step for fear of making a big noise. After all, he had just seen these zombies eating even their own kind. Soon, Murphy reaches the door Zimmerman described. He gently pushes it open and steps inside. Relieved by the silence, following the route, he heads right, finds an iron cage, and sees the power switch inside. The junior zombies clear a path for him, and one even seems to hint at the switch's location when he struggles to find it. As he flips the switch, the lights immediately come on. Upon reaching the warehouse, Murphy finds it filled with unopened drugs. He climbs the metal stairs to the second floor, where the air raid alarm switch and a computer are located. He quickly sits down, turns on the computer, and activates the air raid alarm. The alarm's blaring draws the zombies towards the sound. Zimmerman is pleased, assuming Murphy has succeeded. They walked inside with a sense of excitement. Murphy, meanwhile, uses the computer to open a wireless channel and call Citizen Z at the North Pole Station. He didn't want to ask for help but wanted to ask Citizen Z if there was any sign of DR Merch, the woman who had injected him with the virus, and he wanted to settle the score with her. Citizen Z finds it strange. There's no trace of Merch in California. The last record shows Merch was in Komodo State and then lost contact. At this moment, Zimmerman and his group arrive, exclaiming in excitement at the sight of the drugs. Murphy, already annoyed at not finding Merch and irritated by the trio's loudness, picks up a set of car keys from the table and turns off the outside broadcast. The sudden silence causes the zombies to scatter and charge towards the warehouse. Murphy walked down the stairs with a grimace on his face. Zimmerman, indifferent to Murphy's mood, orders him to help with the drugs. Roberta and her team sneak in, guns pointed at Zimmerman's group. Zimmerman refuses to lower his gun. Aware of Murphy's importance, amid the standoff, zombies enter, Henry is tackled before he can react. 
Roberta and the others had to deal with the zombies first. But fortunately the doorway was narrow and almost every zombie that came in was eliminated. Janice looks for an opportunity to attack but hesitates upon seeing her husband turn zombie. The result was predictable. Five minutes later, Squad X's bullets run out. And they resort to close combat with melee weapons, quickly eliminating the zombies. Zimmerman saw that the tide had turned. But he didn't panic. As long as Murphy was in his hands, he would survive. Murphy closes his eyes, and suddenly, Zimmerman's mind goes blank, his arms going limp. At this moment, Murphy was so handsome, and at the same time, he also made them feel strange, as if this person had changed a lot, and vaguely gave them a sense of oppression. Until Murphy threw the car keys over to them, they felt back to reality. The crisis is averted, but Cassandra's leg wound, aggravated by the ordeal, looks grim. Murphy's personality seems altered exuding an air of authority. Fortunately, he still identifies with his friends Roberta and Doc and agrees with the mission to save the world. His only grievance remains with Dr. Merch, the one who injected him with the virus, and his desire for revenge. However, Citizen Z's investigation reveals that Dr. Merch hadn't gone to California a year ago but was last seen in Komodo State, and then she vanished without a trace. That's strange. If she didn't go to California, why did she ask the X-Team to send Murphy to California? There must be some secret in between. To uncover the truth, Citizen Z hacks into Murch's database. It shows that Murch was a genetic engineering prodigy, becoming an expert at a young age and even inventing a unique gene splicing technique. Strangely, she disappeared two years before the apocalypse, as if evaporated into thin air. It wasn't until three years later, after the zombie virus outbreak, that she reappeared in a New York infectious disease lab where she injected Murphy with the virus vaccine two years ago. After leaving for California in a helicopter, she was never heard from again. Let's make a bold assumption, Dr. Merch might be involved in this global catastrophe. For years before the virus outbreak, a bald man walks the streets of New York, looking every bit the benevolent uncle in his suit and smile. Soon, a man named Johnny approaches him. Johnny gets a high-paying private job on the internet where he is asked to meet a doctor at this traffic light and take him to a drug addict that no one cares about. They cross several blocks to a derelict residential building, a gathering place for addicts. Bill, lying in the room, is an orphan who, due to drug abuse, has his body covered in sores and is now merely awaiting death. Corian is pleased and hands Johnny a small bag of drugs as payment, signaling him to leave quickly. Once the door is shut, Corian, who had appeared kind, kneels beside the bed and pulls out a syringe filled with crimson liquid from his bag. He injects it into Bill's arm, although unclear what it is. The effects are immediate. Bill convulses and groans. Corian is not a doctor. His sole purpose is to experiment on living humans. Neglected addicts like Bill are perfect subjects. Seeing that the injected stuff had almost kicked in Corian used a 20 centimeter long syringe to insert it through Bill's nostrils and then drew out some samples. Afterwards, Corian calmly leaves as if he had only completed a trivial task. Johnny, who had left earlier, is found dead in the hallway, obviously silenced. All signs point to the mysterious man conducting unknown experiments. Not only that, but in the second year, Corian traveled to the Ebola quarantine zone in Africa. He entered a ward where a young boy infected with Ebola was lying in bed. In the third year, Corian traveled to an abandoned deepening laboratory in Kazakhstan and was met by a local middle-aged man. Like Johnny before, this man assisted Kurian in finding subjects for his experiments. However, they found the person already dead, unusable for the experiment. Since the man didn't honor his agreement, Kurian didn't play by the rules either. He first cut the man's gas mask and then crushed a biohazard reagent on the floor. The man immediately struggled to breathe, collapsing and coughing up black blood. He became Kurian's new specimen extractor. In the third year, Kurian visited a small village in Africa. There was a peculiar patient who, since an injury, became like a vegetative person. Oddly, he obeyed commands, leading some to jokingly call him a zombie. While Corian appeared calm, he was internally thrilled by this effect. Exactly what he sought. He even tested with sharp objects. And the man indeed felt no pain. This led to a speculation that Corian was attempting to create a new type of virus. He traveled worldwide collecting various specimens to combine with Dr. Murch's exclusive gene splicing technique. This explains Murch's disappearance for several years before the apocalypse. Unexpectedly, they created a global zombie virus, realizing he had committed a colossal mistake. 
Murch began desperately seeking a solution, leading to the experiments in New York using Murphy and others. All of this became a historical mystery, with Citizen Z only uncovering some basic information about Murch. So, who exactly is Kurian, and what was his purpose in creating the virus? Atop a hill, Team X is resting, currently in a bit of a rough state. Cassandra's wound is infected and has even caused diarrhea. Additionally, Murphy seems off since coming out of the pharmacy. Roberta, with a grim expression, is discussing the situation with Citizen Z. Citizen Z, feeling helpless about the situation, contacted them primarily because he received a radio instruction from DR Merch that morning. The gist of the message was that Team X no longer needed to escort Murphy to California. She and her team were waiting at a lab in Komodo State. Citizen Z noted that the journey was only a 150-mile drive. This might be good news, considering the team's poor condition and limited fuel supply. As Roberta and Doc were discussing the next steps, Murphy, sitting in the car, felt an itch on his forehead, possibly another skin peel. Looking for a mirror, he fumbled with the sun visor in the driver's seat, causing the car keys to fall. An idea struck him to leave with the medicines. As no one wanted to be a guinea pig, after pondering for three seconds, he decisively sat in the driver's seat, ready to start the car, but his plan was interrupted. Roberta relayed Citizen Z's message to Murphy. The car then set off towards the military lab in Komodo State. On the drive, Doc expressed many heartfelt sentiments. He was reluctant to part with Murphy. Although Murphy was not of high moral standing, he had become like family to them through shared experiences. Murphy's eyes teared up. His change was significant, largely influenced by this group of friends, but he wasn't even touched for five seconds. I don't envy you though, man. I mean, hell, once we deliver you, all bets are off. You're gonna have more needles stuck in you than the damn tomato and grandma's sewing basket. Luckily, Roberta had stopped Doc from saying anything else or Murphy wouldn't have dared to go. Two hours later, they arrived at the military lab described by Citizen Z. Strangely, a group of zombies was standing at the gate, unmoved by the noise of their arriving car. Roberta deduced that the zombies were in a dormant state and got out of the car, signaling Murphy to follow. Murphy's heart sank, despite saving them many times, he still wasn't trusted, but Roberta explained that it wasn't about trust. His resemblance to zombies might lead to accidental harm by the welcoming team. Murphy, unconvinced by this explanation, turned and strode towards the entrance. Unexpectedly, their shouts awakened the dormant zombies, who rushed towards them, they quickly got back in the car and shut the doors. There are at least two dozen of these zombies, and at this rate the glass will be shattered sooner or later. The bad thing is that they checked the number of bullets they had, and the total number of bullets they had was less than five. So they couldn't take care of so many zombies, there was only one way to get out of there alive. At this moment, Murphy is more like a child, standing aside and watching the drama unfold, merely to remind them of his own importance. Slowly, he walked to the car and opened the back door, causing them to tense, fearing the zombies would rush in, but Murphy reassured them not to fear, just to follow him and repeatedly reminded them not to shoot. This showed his growing mastery of his abilities, he could clearly feel them. Thus, they moved towards the entrance, huddled around Murphy. Roberta quickly entered the password Citizen Z had given her. The door opened, and they rushed in, not wanting to linger outside. Only Murphy was calm, his eyes patterns deepening. Once inside, he began to boast. No wonder the base looked small from outside. The room was just an elevator, and the real lab was underground. A few ten seconds later, the lift landed. They were expecting a large number of researchers to be waiting for them, but they didn't realize that this place had already fallen and there were corpses all over the place. Cassandra speculated that the zombies outside were attracted by something here. Roberta picked up a staff ID badge and scratched it across the door lock. They entered, thankfully not encountering any zombies which would have meant another bloody battle. Walking along, they saw several bodies sitting around a table, apparently celebrating a birthday before dying. What exactly happened here was clearly not a typical zombie attack and seemed to have occurred just days ago. Suddenly, a zombie's roar echoed from afar, signaling a looming tough fight. 10K's gun has only two bullets left. Using his sniper rifle, 10K searches in the darkness and quickly locks onto the first zombie, which is taken down with a single shot before it can react. Another zombie, wearing protective gear, rushes out but is shot in the head by Doc. Then, 10K spots a zombie behind a shelf. But unfortunately, his shot misses, and he runs out of bullets. The zombies seemed to know they had no bullets and came straight at them. Just after dealing with the zombies, 
they hear a familiar sound. It was the ringing of a mobile phone, which they hadn't heard since the end of the world. Following the sound, they come across a corridor where two bodies lie over a computer, a phone in the man's hand. Doc checks the phone and sees at least 20 unread messages, reading a few aloud. The messages are just conversations between the man and his wife, suggesting that the lab was functioning normally until a few days ago. As Doc is reading the messages, Citizen Z sends a text. It says he saw them using the phone on the surveillance and instructs them to open a computer and enter a code he sent, revealing a shocking secret. Murphy pulls away the body and sits at the computer, entering the code to reveal a video file. The video shows a monkey being experimented on, seemingly in search of a cure for the zombie virus, dated a year before the apocalypse. How could these people have started working on a vaccine before the zombie's virus broke out? The screen then shows the project leader's information the mysterious DR merch. The man in the video is a lab technician. After doing the research Brandon sterilized himself as required but the testing equipment alarmed. Merch isolates Brandon for not following the decontamination process strictly. Despite his protest that he followed the usual procedure and touched nothing, suggesting a detector malfunction, his explanation is ignored. Things are getting weirder, and Doc suggests they leave to avoid any accidents. However, Murphy, in an uncharacteristic display of determination, refuses. He believes they came to find Dr. Merch and shouldn't leave now. In reality, Murphy wants to confront that woman. Surprisingly, Roberta agrees with Murphy's idea. Murphy thinks that although the lab is overrun, Merch might still be alive. And they need to save her to continue their plan to save humanity. Despite their differing motives, they agree to first find Merch. They continued their search deep into the lab. Suddenly, the phone rang again, it was Citizen Z calling, he had just hacked into the lab system and discovered that Team X was in a national-level virus research center. For safety, everyone entering had to be disinfected. Citizen Z sternly reminded them to disinfect again when leaving because the lab was on the highest alert. If anyone left without disinfecting, the lab would be struck by a tactical nuclear weapon to ensure the virus wouldn't spread. Simply put, it will be destroyed by a nuclear bomb to ensure that the virus doesn't spread. The last point Citizen Z made was that the disinfection required complete nudity. Murphy, unfazed, started undressing immediately. They couldn't help but be curious when they actually got naked. And they also saw that Murphy's skin seemed to be getting more and more zombie-like as the scars began to spread all over his body. They prepared themselves. And 10K pressed the switch, causing a burning sensation to fill the space. Three minutes later, Cassandra had only just finished dressing when she collapsed in a weak heap. She couldn't hold on any longer and tried to get her mates to leave her alone and move on. But of course, they wouldn't agree. In the end, 10K carried Cassandra. They came to a door, which Roberta gently pushed open. The place seemed unusual. Isolation signs adorned the walls, and the lighting was dim, necessitating the use of flashlights. Along the corridor were small rooms, each view inside more hair-raising than the last. One room contained an old man with tubes all over his body and no lower legs. Before they could fully take in the sight, Roberta gasped at the scene in another room. It was even more horrific, a woman, her body covered in black spots, with flies buzzing around her, shockingly still alive. This lab didn't just experiment on animals but even on living people. Roberta wanted to open the door to end the woman's suffering, but that would release the flies. 10K then checked the other rooms, all similar in their horrors. But one door was open, surely something had escaped. While they were discussing it, a strange noise came from around them, shining their flashlights. They spotted two figures crouching in the corner, ready to pounce, Doc said with a shaky voice. Murphy, aren't you good at communicating with zombies? Go talk to them, though uncertain. Murphy approached, as it was rare for Doc to ask for his help. These were indeed two zombies. Murphy focused, sending out thoughts to make them back off. But as soon as he finished speaking, the two mutated zombies lunged at them. In the dim light, chaos ensued. Murphy, showing rare bravery, charged forward, ultimately ending the fight in a surprisingly cool pose. Thankfully, the corridor ahead was well lit, providing them with a sense of safety. However, Cassandra, in 10K's arms, felt she was nearing her end and didn't want to burden the others. Luckily, it turned out she had just passed out, being too weak to keep up. They found a room to lay her in bed. Roberta comforted Cassandra, saying, Rest here for now, we'll come back for you after finding DR merch. Roberta then took out her cherished lucky bullet, loaded it into her revolver, and placed the gun by Cassandra's bed, just in case. The unspoken understanding was clear to all. Grateful, Cassandra knew she would use the gun in her final moment. 
not wanting to turn into a hideous zombie. Then Doc and 10K also said their goodbyes, understanding that this parting might be forever. After everyone left, Murphy returned at a jog, having scouted ahead and discovered something. Noticing the group's somber mood, he guessed Cassandra's condition had worsened. Entering the room, Murphy tenderly touched Cassandra's forehead and smiled softly. A minute later, Murphy emerged, leading them to the blood trail he had found. It looked as if a body had been dragged along, the trail extending all the way to the bio storage room. The red lighting in this area gave off an eerie vibe. Roberta, knife in hand, was ready for anything. After opening the door, the bloodstains on the ground were still visible, and the array of containers inside gave them the feeling of having entered a morgue. At the center, they saw a half-body on a stretcher, the source of the blood trail, decomposed beyond recognition. Unbelievably, it was still alive. They wondered if this could be DR. Merch. Murphy checked a name tag and denied their speculation. This should be the Brandon who was isolated by Merch. Brandon, on the stretcher, overheard their conversation and tapped his hand on the keyboard. Should you been giving the monkeys? I've seen the side effect. Their perception of Merch, once thought to be a key figure in saving humanity was utterly changed by what they had witnessed today. The video had revealed that Murphy wasn't the first to develop an immunity to the virus. It was Brandon, but his fate was tragic. Brandon's every moment was agony, and death seemed to release, realizing he might share the same fate. Murphy urged them to leave quickly. Just then, Citizen Z appeared on the computer screen. He told Team X that there were others here, possibly DR. Merch. Accompanied by two armed soldiers heading their way. As Citizen Z finished speaking, the door was abruptly opened. Murphy finally came face to face with DR. Merch. Whom he despised deeply. Despite facing an armed opponent, he showed no signs of backing down. But to his shock, Murphy was bewildered as the woman he sought revenge against was already dead. Meanwhile, at the North Pole Station, Citizen Z heard about DR Kurtz for the first time and immediately used his hacking skills to search for information. The results were astonishing. Kurtz was not only the patent holder for the AIDS vaccine but also the developer of the second-generation Ebola vaccine and a Nobel Prize winner for eradicating the SARS virus, truly one of humanity's elites. However, Citizen Z was confused when he saw Kurtz's photo in the files. It was not the same person. The man outside was an imposter. Who was he? And what was his purpose? Sensing something amiss, Citizen Z rapidly initiated facial recognition scanning. Inside the lab, the imposter Kurtz amiably said, We've put a lot of effort into finding you, Mr. Murphy. Now you're safe, and your friends will be recognized by the government as heroes who saved humanity. But after seeing what happened to Brandon, Roberta worriedly asked how they intended to treat Murphy. Kurtz reassured them, saying they only plan to take Murphy to a lab in California to replicate his antibodies and hopefully create a useful vaccine. While he was speaking softly, Citizen Z had already identified this man as DR Kurian through facial recognition. He quickly searched Kurian's personal profile in the database, finding it encrypted. But that wasn't a challenge for this seasoned programmer. As Citizen Z was cracking the encryption, Murphy made his stance clear. He didn't want to be an experimental subject. Hearing this, Kurian's smile disappeared as he threatened Murphy with the same fate as Brandon on the stretcher if he didn't do as he was told. Kurian even ordered his men to quickly finish off Brandon. Murphy approached the stretcher, his previously fierce expression softening. He offered to do it himself. Feeling a pang of sympathy for Brandon, a fellow sufferer. He didn't want the cold-hearted people to do it. Brandon's voice was so faint, only Murphy could hear him. Don't trust him. I'm not going. Murphy's response made Kurian's face turn sour, seeing that they seemed ready to take action. Although Roberta didn't understand why Murphy was resisting, she still took out her weapon and stood by his side. Doc also tried to mediate, suggesting that Murphy usually had a strong sense of public duty and was just a bit tense at the moment. He proposed that everyone could sit down and talk it over. Meanwhile Citizen Z finally breaks the code and sees Dr. Kurian's profile. Citizen Z's voice came from the computer, but it was too faint, and amidst the ongoing conversation, Team X couldn't hear it. Fortunately, 10K, sensing something, looked back, but before he could inform the others, there was a noise at the door as if something was hitting it. Kurian, thinking it was zombies, calmly sent his men to handle it, but the men realized something was amiss. Zombies don't open doors. To their surprise, it was Cassandra who entered, her face bearing a bite mark and her pupils showing patterns. 10K couldn't believe his eyes. Cassandra, who had been at death's door, was now alive and well before him. 
which was utterly bizarre. Only Murphy had a smile on his lips. Team X was both delighted and incredulous. They could only guess that this was somehow related to Murphy. Seizing the moment, Murphy quickly escaped. Kurian, in a panic, shot at Team X, hitting Doc in the shoulder. Roberta and the others didn't chase after Murphy or Kurian. Instead, they gathered around Doc, shouting loudly to wake him. Murphy, on the other hand, ran towards the exit. Not wanting to stay a moment longer, he rushed back along the route they came to the disinfection room. Knowing that beyond it lay the elevator, Citizen Z's voice came through the overhead speakers, urgently reminding he of the high-level virus research center's protocol. Full disinfection for anyone leaving, or risk a nuclear strike. Suddenly, there was the sound of a door opening behind him. Corian had also fled to this location. Trying to open that door, Murphy didn't want to care about anyone else right now. He only trusted himself, but he pushed the door a few times and it didn't open, so he had to keep his hands on the doorknob. Finally, the door opened, and an announcement about the activation of the safety system echoed through the lab. Corian panicked and shot the door lock to break it, quickly making his escape. He knew exactly what this meant. Murphy reached the exit and pulled down the elevator, gradually ascending to the ground level. He felt conflicted about possibly endangering his companions by running out. Just then, feeling his forehead peel, Murphy didn't panic as before. Instead, he sensed that shedding his outer skin might lead to a rebirth. Meanwhile, in an unknown location, a nuclear missile was launched, targeting the lab, its sound covering thousands of kilometers. Citizen Z, seeing a blip on the map, panicked, it was a real nuclear strike, and the timer showed less than seven minutes until impact. Roberta and the others, hearing the alarm, realized the gravity of the situation but couldn't leave Doc behind. Coincidentally, a soldier who had just died turned into a zombie and started approaching them. Suddenly, Cassandra rushed out and pounced on the zombie. Fortunately, Doc finally responded, indicating he wasn't hit in a vital area. They quickly retreated towards their original path, but worse was yet to come. Citizen Z saw on the map that not just one, but multiple nuclear missiles were launched from surrounding military bases. It's evident that this laboratory was far from simple, perhaps researching something that must absolutely not reach the outside world. Citizen Z, tears in his eyes, felt disillusioned with his country for the first time and guilty about his own misdirected commands. A minute later Murphy's lift door opened, but a closer look revealed that he was completely naked. He then started a van and sped away. Roberta and her team reached the elevator, with only three minutes left before the explosion. As they ascended, 10K noticed skin in a corner. Murphy went so far as to peel the skin off his entire body. When they came outside, the van had been driven away by Murphy. Luckily, there was a black SUV, presumably Koreans, just as they were about to start it. They saw nuclear missiles plummeting from the sky, frightening them into quickly driving away. Sadly, Cassandra was left in the lab, with little hope of survival. Corian was also running in a certain direction. Citizen Z ran outside the base, despairingly watching dozens of nuclear missiles ascend. The final outcome would be revealed in the second season.